earth. Almighty and ever living God, we are so much grateful to you for artificial intelligence among us, especially in higher education. We thank you for the gift of life of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We thank you for what you have used us to accomplish in the life of humanity. And we thank you for our achievement of being the hub of quality education. We thank you for the gift of the management, staff, students, and all those who love and care for KNUST and contribute to us in one way or the other to make us great and strong. We pray for such blessings and favors in our lives. We thank you for our dear Chancellor Nobles of IIT. We thank you for blessing her with this exchange of wisdom, knowledge, understanding. And we thank you for this gathering this morning. We thank you for Jenny Mercies for bringing our dear young ones also to us to participate in this debate. It is our prayer that as we gather, you grant us all the graces and blessings that we need to make this day a blessing for us in our lives. We entrust our dear debaters to you. We thank you for the effort, the blessings, the favor, the strength you've given them, and all the enlightenment that has gone into their preparation. It is our prayer that you grant them the gift of eloquence, that they will bless us with their wisdom and intelligence. For those of us who are still on our way coming, we pray and trust in them to you. Bring them to us safely and sound, and inspire us with your spirit. And may what we witness today here make us ambassadors of everything that happens here, that we too will be a blessing to humanity. These and many blessings we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Shall we please resume our seats? Thank you very much, Reverend Father. And that puts us in a very good note to start the program. At this juncture, we would invite the Director of Student Affairs of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in the person of Professor Wilson Ejare to give us the opening remarks for this program. Good morning to you all. Um, Madam Vice Chancellor, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the only Vice Chancellor of the best university in terms of quality education as per the Times Higher Education, SDG 4. I salute to you, Madam. Um, Chancellor of MIT, Professor, I salute you in, in whose honor this. Uh, debate is being organized. Uh, the Dean Quality Assurance, the Deputy Registrar, Directorate of Student Affairs, the Chaplain, other senior members gathered here, and especially the debaters. I greet you all. And most importantly, my future sons and daughters, who I will be expecting you very soon in Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology from other secondary schools uh, in our neighborhood. You are most welcome to Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology where academic excellence is paramount to us. Um, Madam Vice Chancellor, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has always been at the forefront of empowering students to excel uh, in various fields of knowledge. Our university is dedicated to providing an inclusive and supportive environment that enables the students to explore their intellectual interests, broaden their horizon, and engage in critical thinking. This public debate serves as a, a testament to our commitment to fostering intellectual discourse and also their personal growth. In our rapidly evolving society, with political events, technological advancement, climate change, and other phenomena that continue to shape our world, this debate prompts us to assess the newcomer, the uh, one in town, 
which in terms of higher education, the artificial intelligence is impact on us as stakeholders in higher education. I hope that this carefully chosen topic challenges our perspectives and enhances our understanding. Our debate society, which is one of the best in the world and the best in Africa, has worked tirelessly in response to, in response to the university's call. They were engaged for a period of three weeks. And these three weeks, uh, one week had to be spent uh, during mid semester. So the first week, they started the preparation. They had to break for mid semester and then continue after us. After the mid semester, they've engaged in doing rehearsals. They've done th three rehearsals and one mock. And Madam, I believe they are well prepared to deliver. Madam Vice Chancellor, I would like to also express my sincere admiration for the courage and dedication in participating in this distinguished event. This presence, their presence here carries a significant weight as they possess the power to influence, inspire, and bring out the through their persuasive arguments and insightful perspectives on stage. They have been thoroughly prepared to challenge our assumptions, broaden our perspective, and elevate the level of discourse. It is our hope that this occasion provides us with the opportunity to celebrate the intellectual vibrancy of our university, the diversity of thought, and the power of ideas. Through this public debate, we aim to create an environment where students can question assumptions, explore new perspectives, and foster empathy, understanding, and respect. May this gathering be an enriching experience for all, igniting a passion for knowledge, fostering intellectual curiosity, and nurturing the lasting spirit of inquiring among our students. Let us seize this opportunity and moment to embrace the transformative potential of dialogue and pave the way toward a brighter future. On this note, I wish you all welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson Ejari. He's actually the father of all KNUSD students. All right, thank you. At this point, we will take remarks by the project lead of key PI and scientific, uh, who is the project lead and PI and scientific director of Rio. All right. Is the person of Professor Jerry John Ponyo. Ponyo, Ponyo is the name. Okay. Professor Mrs. Rita Akosia Dixon, Vice Chancellor, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Our special guest of honor, Chancellor Melissa Nobles of MIT. Our Deputy Registrar, Provost of Colleges, Deans and Directors, Members of Convocation, our cherished student leaders, the Right Honorable Speaker, if he is here, and distinguished audience both in person and online. Our friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The Responsible Artificial Intelligence Lab, REAL for short, under the, uh, the KNUSC Engineering Education Project, KEEP, in the College of Engineering, has a mandate to build capacity in artificial intelligence to lead the fourth industrial revolution. We are confident that AI holds the key to transforming key sectors of the African economy. 
with the application of artificial intelligence in the public sector, it is possible to cut wastage and enhance efficiency. It is worthy of note that an AI solution is as good as the data set based on which the models are trained. There is no doubt that AI is a good thing, but if unregulated, there is the possibility to generate adverse consequences. Rail has therefore become a strong voice of advocacy for the responsible use of artificial intelligence. Today, Rail is collaborating with the Student Representative Council Debating Society to educate the general public on the impact of AI and emerging technologies on higher education. It is my hope that this public debate will trigger further discussion leading to policy decisions on how universities can position ourselves to harness the positive benefits of technology while guarding against the negatives. Even though this debate is focused on higher education, AI and emerging technologies have far-reaching consequences on the entire educational system and society. May this debate trigger an AI policy dialogue on practical steps we need to take as a nation to benefit fully from AI and emerging technologies. I want to thank the Directorate of Student Affairs, heavily led by my senior colleague, Professor Wilson Ajay Ajari, for working with us to realize this vision. I also want to thank the S Let's give it to him. Let's give it to him. We can do better than that. The entire Directorate, phenomenal. I also want to thank the SRC, especially the leadership of the debating society, for the hard work and sacrifices you put into preparing for this first public debate. Let's give it to them as well. I thank my very own vice chancellor and the entire management of the university for the immense support. She deserves more, 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 more. Before I take my seat, I would like to thank Chancellor Nanajua Melissa Nobles, <laughs> our special guest from MIT, for her show of support and friendship in the affairs of KNUSC. Let's give it to her. I say a big thank you to my colleagues in Keep and Rail who continue to work tirelessly for the success of this university. May the God of heaven bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for these words. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, we would hear from the president of the KNUST Debate Society in the person of Master Kojoe Champon. And he's a one-time Pan-African Universities Debate Champion and a reigning Ghana Universities Debate Champion as well. The chairperson, Professor Mrs. Rita Kusia Dixon, our special guest, Professor Melissa Nobles, permit me to stand on a already established protocol to give the submission. On behalf of the debate society, I would want to welcome you to this public debate. We thank you for making time to join us today. The University Debate Society aspires to be the center of thought within the university and beyond. And we do this by recruiting students and training them to healthily engage their predispositions. We train them in public speaking and we also train them to think critically. While we are most noted for representing the investing competitive debates organized by private institutions at the national level, at the regional level, and at the world level, 
at the heart of our endeavors lies a profound commitment to contribute to discourse that benefits our society. Professor Nobles, on Wednesday, you mentioned that the role of students is to invent the future, and the way in which my friends and I have chosen to do this is to harness the power of communication. Our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mrs. Rita Kosia Dixon, our patron, Professor Kofi Uso Hinidekon, the sports director, Mr. Timothy Mensa, and his team at the directorate have also been very helpful in inspiring and motivating my team and I to realize that, and they continue to do so. Particularly for this event, um, you would want to recognize and appreciate the joint efforts of Professor Ponyo, Professor Wilson Ajari, the Dean of Students, Mr. Boabin, and Mr. Frank Owusu, the SRC president, for their unwavering belief in our abilities and making the university debate possible. Public debates offer communities like ours an opportunity to engage its stakeholders on issues that are relevant to them. It provides a platform for people to be heard, for questions to be asked, for people to be informed, and for perspective to be broadened. It is our prayer that the university would adopt public debate and expand it beyond students in the debate society. We hope that subsequent iterations would have university staff, industry personnel, and key figures in fields under review, as well as students, debate one another. By doing so, our great university would be able to harness and unleash the full potential of public debate. It would be a great learning opportunity for my team and I to be able to debate our mentors and our leaders. It would be a great opportunity to be heard as your cherished students, madam. In fulfilling our sacred duty to the university, we crafted a debate format that transcends the boundaries of traditional competitive debate. We experimented on various ways on how we can involve you, our cherished audience, today. And in doing so, we are glad to share with you the products of meticulous research and innovation. We hope that the university honors Prof. Kofi Onuso Deokon by naming this public debate format after him. He represents the principles of public debate, which is discourse and collaboration, and it is unmatched and we are very sure that all that have worked with him have experienced him and would attest to that fact. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1975, when Britain was considering remaining in the European Economic Community, one of the three units of the European Community which preceded the European Union, the Oxford Debate Union had a public debate on the topic, this house would say yes to Europe. The public debate was held just two days to the election or the referendum to make that particular determination, and it was televised on BBC One. It is reported that it played a key role in swaying public opinion, which went out for um, the Britain to stay with the EC. The Oxford Union is also known to have indulged Malcolm X in a debate about black extremism in 1964. Notwithstanding the fact that these are examples from a distant past and from a distant land, to us today, they represent a key university that is able to leverage the strength of collaboration between its partners, staff, and students to further its aspirations. They represent a key university that is taking its rightful place in Ghana and Africa as being a platform for holistic exchange of ideas and collaboration. They represent a key university that understands the complex dynamics of national and regional development and so would put in place measures that positions itself and its partners, its staff, and its students to be able to be key players in the development of Africa. They represent the extent to which higher education can become relevant to everyday decision making. And so the University Debate Society is therefore happy to be part of um, this event. We are happy to be architects of the future of our noble university and we invite you, esteemed professors, university officials and staff, senior high school students, alumni and fellow students to join us, embrace dialogue and collaboration. Together, let us utilize this course to further who we are, leaders in change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kojo, for that brilliant speech. Um, this public debate is taking a very innovative format 
which particularly seeks to engage audience in a style that is quite rare. Introducing that to the particular format we are adopting in this debate would be the Registrar of Ken Westy. Good morning. Madam, with your permission, I want to activate the established protocol and proceed. Like my MC just said, I am representing the registrar, Mr. Andrews Kwesi Boateng, who is equally engaged in another university assignment, and he has asked me to represent him. It is an honor and a privilege to be here this morning. And we are talking of innovation like uh, our chancellor said, we need to reimagine the future using students and we position this university for the future. And so the debating uh, society, they have managed to come out with this innovation and I want to share with you. The essence is to ensure that we fully participate in the debate as the debate is going on. So the debating society, we thank you so much for what you have put together. We are going to have two sides, as you can see, the proponent and those speaking against the motion. Each team will be made up of four people, as you can see them, four here, four here. And what is going to happen is that the first speaker will make the very cogent main argument that is build a strong case for their side. After that, the second speaker will come in to also make a presentation, but he will extend his own argument and solidify the argument that the team is trying to put across. And this is the exciting part. After two on my left and two on my right, we'll pause and then the moderator will engage us, the audience. That is the new thing they are introducing. So it's not just the debaters who are talking. All of us will be encouraged to come in and then also share our views on the topic at hand. The essence is for us to all deliberate on artificial intelligence. Then after that, the test speakers will come in and their duty is to clarify, rebuild, and refute major claims against their side. As we know, they will come in. My opponent said this, and so it is their duty for the test speakers to just do that. And then finally, the fourth speakers will come in, and their task is just to summarize whatever their team have said based on what the first speaker said, the second speaker said, the third speaker said, and then make a compelling argument for their side. The audience will then be given opportunity to also come in and, as we are saying, for the second time, also share their perspective on the issue that we are discussing, which is artificial intelligence, whether it is a blessing or a curse. This is how the timing is going to. Please, debaters, pay attention to me. You have eight minutes to make your point. And in case you are not able to do that in eight minutes, we are giving you extra 30 seconds to finish it up. The audience, if you should have opportunity, the whole exercise for the audience side is just 10 and 15 minutes, so please pay attention. And one of the innovations that they have brought in is that during the debate, as the person is making the point, at any point in time, you can come and interrupt them in a very polite way by raising up your hand. And so you can come in point of information or maybe a point of clarification. And it is at the discretion of the speaker whether to allow you to make that point. Or if he's so busy he wants to move ahead, he will ignore you politely. So please don't be offended. The power is his to determine whether you come in or you don't come in. And then at any point in time, somebody comes in like that, will pause the time so that it doesn't go against the speaker, and then we'll continue. One of the things we also want to do is our engagement. Before the debate, and very soon we'll project a link for us to 
vote on the topic. So we are all going to take an initial stand in research, let's say, pretest. And then after that, they will give us the treatment, which is the actual debate, and then we'll vote for the second time to see whether they have managed to change our perception about the, uh, the topic we are discussing. So there will be an initial debate, the debate will come on, and then we'll also have a second opportunity to vote. And during the voting, the third part, we also have opportunity to state our opinion. So normally, it's binary, whether you are for the motion or against the motion. But there will be a third option, so please pay attention where you vote and then you state your own opinion about it. Because as my dean, Quality Assurance, said, the essence is to dialogue. And if possible, we'll have a policy in place to guide artificial intelligence in Africa and the world. So we want to encourage you to, to participate fully and we want to thank you for your audience and your participation. Thank you so much. I wish all the debaters the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, like he said, this public debate is to influence our thoughts and reason together in a discourse. We would like to take the voting before the debate starts. And after the debate, we would vote again to see whether the kind of engagement we've had here has influenced our thoughts or probably um, changed our decisions. So we will take the votes right now. The link will be projected on the screen. All right, so we would invite Kojo to lead us through how particularly we can do this. So we recognize that um, not everyone would be able to scan. So in the event where you've been able to scan, you could please share the link to um, someone else so that the person would be um, able to do that. We would use a num um, three minutes for the voting period. And so we would invite the band to give us some musical interlude while our audience um, joining us um, live as well as present in this auditorium would vote. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So those of us who have phones, let's kindly try to scan the QR code and do the voting. All right, a moment. So, um, the band kindly, let's take a short exercise. All right, so we recognize that our dear senior high school students who have joined us particularly did not come with phones. So would want to participate, uh, get them to participate as well. And so as the online votes are going on with those who have phones, we will take a head count of their position. So we're going to do it very simple. Um, the motion for today is about whether artificial intelligence and emerging 
technologies a blessing or a curse to higher education. So before we have the debate, let's get to know those who believe that artificial intelligence and emerging technologies are a blessing to higher education. So you will kindly stand up and then we get you counted. So if you believe it's a blessing, kindly be on your feet. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. I think with this, we could just have it as a popular acclamation. <laughs> I think, I think um, a significant majority believe that it's a blessing. All right. So kindly be on your seat. We would see whether after the debate, you would have a change in your thoughts. All right. The band can continue with the interludes as we continue with the online voting. Kindly try to send the link to others for them to vote as well. Thank you very much, school band, for that quite entertaining interlude. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important to notice that today's public debate is happening under the distinguished patronage of a personality who takes keen interest in discourse, critical thinking, and reasoning. And his particular, her particular interest in student development has been quite remarkable. With a standing ovation, ladies and gentlemen, shall we welcome the Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in the person of Professor Rita Akosua Dixon. Thank you. Before our Vice Chancellor speak, may we take the KNUSD school anthem.
May we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land. Let me stand on the very beautiful protocol established already and say good morning to our guest of honor, Chancellor Melissa Nobles of MIT, and to all our distinguished guest this morning, and especially to my dear students and also to our students, our future KNUSD students coming from all the um, senior high schools. Conversations, having conversations are very important in every endeavor of life, and I am very, very happy that we can spend this morning to listen to ourselves on a very important topic, pitching it on one of the new kids on the block, artificial intelligence. The Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has a mandate to conduct high quality impactful research to drive developmental agenda both at home and abroad. The strategic plan of our great university seeks to position KNUSD as a beacon of hope as far as quality education in the sub-region is concerned. The World Economic Forum has clearly outlined steps Africa needs to take in responding to the fourth industrial revolution. It has been clearly established that digital developmental tools are the key enablers to drive economic transformation, which therefore requires institutions of higher learning in the sub-region to focus on programs directed at equipping the next generation of graduates with the requisite tools to lead the digital revolution. Artificial intelligence holds a lot of promise and is seen as a game changer in transforming the digital economy. It is, however, instructive to mention that the development and deployment of AI solutions must be done responsibly. With the advent of generative AI and large language models such as chat GPT, there has been a lot of discussion on regulating the use of AI. It has even been suggested by major tech players that a moratorium should be placed on further development of AI. The impact of AI on higher education cannot be overemphasized and requires a rethink of our approaches and strategies as far as teaching and learning is concerned. There are several views regarding the impact of AI on higher education. Debates offer a fine opportunity to hear from both sides of the argument. It also provides an avenue to educate the general public, and it's something that we must all encourage. This morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, students, the debating society of the best university in Ghana, and the fourth, and the one that is best globally when we take the fourth SDG, which is what? Quality education, globally. Our debating 
society is the best. And I'm not just saying this. Last year, we were all in this university, and we know what they did. Locked horns with universities like Yale, London School of Economics, and they brought the trophies here. Congratulations. Congratulations. So that is the kind of group that we have to lead this debate. We are so proud of them, Mr. Champon and your team. We salute you. Thank you very much. Can you do it better for them? <laughs> Extremely proud of them. Of course, I salute the SRC for the great leadership that they are giving in this university. This morning, the camera will be on the topic AI and emerging technologies. Is it a blessing or is it a curse? Just with the standing that uh, the, the senior high school students just did, I guess we have a fair idea. But we never know. We need to listen, and then at the end of the day, combining what is going on virtually with the voting and what we have physically here, we will all decide. Additionally, this morning, we have the real opportunity, of course, of having the chancellor of MIT, my sister Melissa Nobles, with us. There's something interesting you must know about her. She is a debater herself, a very professional one. <laughs> yes, a social scientist and a powerful debater, I want to put it. And as we have this debate today, all that personally I'm looking forward to is the day that her MIT debating students will meet the KNUSD debaters. Thank you, thank you. I want to thank the Directorate of Student Affairs, DOSA, ably led by Professor Wilson Ajari, the papa of this great university. Papa, thank you. We won't collect money from you if you clap for him. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are also thanking the KNUSD Engineering Education Project and the Responsible Artificial Intelligence Lab, REAL, um, which is jointly led by Professor J.J. Ponyo. I have to pronounce it very well <laughs> for pulling this off. Prof, thank you so very much. Thank you. I indeed have to thank the SRC and of course the leadership, and I'm talking about leadership of SRC, and also the leadership of the debating society for accepting the challenge and putting this piece together. I cannot put this mic down without saluting my dear basic school band. This is the band of the best university. Clap for them. Young, young, young children, always giving us melodious music. We love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to wish both sides of the debate the very best of luck. And we do look forward to an exciting debating time this morning. God richly bless us all. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for those words. At this point, we would recognize the presence of the national president of the Women in Engineering, 
in the person of engineer Dr. Pekpena. We, we also have in our midst the regional STEM coordinator, Ashanti, um, in the person of Mr. Adams Isifu. From GS, um, also we have in our midst Nana Opoku Echampon, who is the Asenia Hene Kwamo. We also have in the presence Mr. Frank Asamoa Damte, who is the father of one of our debaters, Kelvin Damte. Welcome, Daddy. We have Professor Edward Apia, who is a Director General for National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we also have in our midst Engineer Enyonam Kekpena. I've already acknowledged her presence, who is the um, Women in Engineering National Coordinator. At this point in time, we are getting closer to why we are here, to witness the debate. This debate is solely happening, um, taking care of in terms of um, the speakers and all that by the KNUST Debate Society. And it's important to note that the KNUST Debate Society was formed as an incubator for brilliant critical thinkers who would shake the foundations of policy making, innovation, and creative ideas. Over the years, the KNUST Debate Society has evolved to become the best university debate society in this part of the world. And that is backed by incontrovertible evidence. With the debate society over the past seven years, winning five out of seven of the Ghana University Debates Championship. And what is much interesting is that before Real Madrid did back-to-back, KNUST -back, Debate Society did a back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back four times of the Ghana University Debate Championship. And currently, we are the defending champions. That is not all. The KNUST Debate Society in 2018, 2019, and 2020 were the African debating champions. So that's another back to back to back. Our presence has also been felt at the world stage. This year, we were in the finals of the World Universities Debate Championship. What this means is that you can expect a very interesting and high-level intellectual engagement today. And we are promising nothing less than that. So we would invite um, the person of Ms. Dorinda Inti to introduce to us the debaters who you would be hearing in this debate. Ms. Dorinda is a second year environmental science student. Thank you very much. The chairperson, Professor Mrs. Rita Akusia Dixon, permits me to stand on the already existing protocols to say good morning to all of you here. It is the singular honor done me this morning to present our enthralled speakers for today's debate. I also want to thank the chancellor and the Debate Society for giving me this opportunity to stand here before you this morning. On the affirmative side, 
Our first speaker is a driven individual for a passion for higher education and research. He is a first year MPhil student in clinical microbiology, aiming to become a leading research scientist in the field. Graduating with a first class in biological sciences, he now works as a postgraduate student in the Filariasis Research Group at the esteemed Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine, KCCR, KNUST. Alongside his academic pursuits, he has showcased exceptional skills in competitive debating and public speaking. He is the current intercollegiate debate champion and has represented the university as national, <laughs> continental, and global debate competitions. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker for the affirmative, Master Prince Dennis Atisu. Our second speaker from the affirmative is a third year student reading BA Media and Communication Studies with a specialization in public relations. She is a writer and a former beauty queen. When not writing, she takes solace in music, which sparked her decision to undertake the Associated Board of Royal School Music of Music Examination. She plays the local flute, which is called the Antentebain. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame Nanaya. Please stand so the audience can see you. Our third speaker, also from the same side, is a final year student reading political studies and is the president of the Political Studies Students Association. He is currently serving as the financial secretary for the Ghana Investors Debate Association. He also served as the financial secretary for the KNUST Debate Society. He is also the financial controller for Kumasi Debates Open, an organization that seeks to unite Ghanaian, African, and international voices, a vision of Franco Osaiwusu, which has impacted lives of people through the Kumasi Debates Open Care Foundation. He is also the winner of the 2022 K.A. Andam Intercollegies Debates Competition. He believes in God and hopes that he continues to contribute his quota to help Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, Master Opong Selod. Our last speaker from the affirmative side, if he is asked to talk about what he is most passionate about, he would say discourse. For him, nothing says discourse more than debating. In the period he has spent debating, he has had debates with people on the stages of World Universities Debate Champion, Pan-African Universities Debate Championship, debate championships held by Cornell and Yale Universities, Sofia University in Bulgaria, as well as Durham, Oxford and Cambridge, where he performed impressively. He says if this course was a person, he would get a cup of coffee and have a conversation with him. The conversation would be about this course. Ladies and gentlemen, Master Dovolo Desmond. On the negative, we also have four, com we have four competitive debaters. Our first debater is a final year computer science student and the captain of Kane West's debate team. He is an IoT enthusiast in smart devices. He is a distinguished student leader who has helped advocate for students at all levels of student democracy. He has been a class representative, a department association PRO, a college student association vice president, and he is currently the SRC presidential advisor. He is a proud affiliate of the University Hall. He won King West's third African debate trophy in 2020. He won the National Debate Trophy in 2022, and this year he was in the World Debate Semifinals. Ladies and gentlemen, our captain, Master Kojo Echampo. Our second speaker is the only freshman student on today's debate panel. She is majoring in communications and minoring in linguistics. Two things she is passionate about are football and human psychology. In senior high school, she worked as an executive of various societies, including the Writers and Debaters Club, the school's editorial board, as well as served as the library prefect of her school. She was also a recipient of the Duke of Edinburgh Silver Award, something she is very proud of. 
In her free time, she likes to watch true crime shows, read books, and listen to music. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame Yudia Mafua up here. Our third speaker on the negative is a dynamic student of Kane USD, currently in her third year studying BA Media and Communications. As the first ever president of the Media and Communications Study Students Association, she showcases her strong passion for leadership and her dedication to empowering her peers. Her love for socialization allows her to effortlessly connect with people from diverse backgrounds, creating meaningful relationships along the way. She has a keen appreciation for beauty, particularly in the color bloom. With her vibrant personality and commitment to personal growth, she is set to making a lasting impact in the field of media and communications and leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame Belinda Inketia. Our last speaker on the negative is an AI enthusiast, a car guy, a national debate champion, a world debate semi-finalist, a former president for computer science, arguably the most prolific poet in Kane University. It is really hard to find the perfect words to describe him. Consistently a man for big stages and work behind the scenes, he is sure to be the perfect mix of Pablo Picasso and Nikola Tesla. <laughs> Having represented the university in all levels of varsity debating, it is no shock that he handles the training of the next set of champions for the university. An aspiring diplomat and computer scientist is your minority chief whip Master Kelvin Asamoah Damte. Before I leave the stage, I would also like to introduce our moderator for today's event. He is an exceptional career research scientist and a postgraduate studying and a postgraduate student in pharmaceutical microbiology with a passion for intellectual discourse and a gift for persuasive communication he has established himself as a prominent figure in the world of debating which he solidified by winning Kane West's second pan-african universities debate trophy his remarkable and unwavering commitment to excellence have earned him numerous accolades and recognition. He is a passionate advocate for free speech and believes in the power of open dialogue to foster understanding and drive positive change. He takes special delight in using his skills to advocate for important causes and champion underrepresented voices. With a deep sense of responsibility, he utilizes his platform to bring attention to social issues and works tirelessly to promote inclusivity and representation. Ladies and gentlemen, Master Michael Ampa, thank you very much for your time. I thank you very much, Dorinda, for introducing our speakers and myself. So we'll go straight to the debate. Joining me to moderate this debate will be Ms. Agatha Chumesi, who will be the secretary and transcriber for the debate. And then also, Ms. Dorinda would also join us to moderate the debate. So debaters are set. Debaters are set and we'll take it up right from here. It's already been told that the, each speaker has eight minutes to make a speech, and we take turns, engage audience at some point in time, get back to the debate, and take voting proceedings again. All right, so I'll take my seat there, and then we'll continue.
At the heart of today's debate is an important resolution that we have to make. Across history, we've had several revolutions happening. Within the particular context of technology, we've seen the industrial revolutions, and we are currently in the fourth industrial revolution, with AI seeking to redefine and shake the foundations of society. In this debate, we are answering one epistemic question. Is the particular adoption of AI and emerging technologies in higher education a blessing or a curse? So that's the issue that debaters in this debate will be speaking to. The motion particularly is AI and emerging technologies, a blessing or a curse to higher education. Would invite the principal speaker on the affirmative side to make an opening speech for their side. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to be here and grateful for this opportunity. I begin my speech. The Vice Chancellor of KNUST, the special invited guest, Chancellor of MIT, the Pro Vice Chancellor of KNUST, the Director of Students Affairs, Provosts, Deans and Directors, Heads of Departments, Members of Convocation, Senior and Junior Staff, the clergy, alumni, students, our friends in the media, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols duly observed. In this momentous age of progress, where innovation surges with unparalleled vigor, we stand on the precipice of a transformative era in higher education. AI and emerging technologies spring forth as a celestial blessing, bestowing upon us the keys to unlock the doors of wisdom previously thought unattainable. The negative side would have you recall in traditional pedagogy and fan the flames of fear mongering that typified the opposition to the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and information revolution. These revolutions did not destroy humanity, but are the tools building a more resilient and prosperous civilization. The Miriam Webster Dictionary enlightens us on key definitions in this debate. One, higher education. It's post-secondary education that culminates in the award of a degree. Biblically, a blessing is a gift from God. It is also anything conducive to happiness or welfare. Third, artificial intelligence is the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. Finally, emerging technologies are a range of innovative technologies that are still in the early stages of development or have recently entered the market. Virtual reality and augmented reality are a few examples. KNUST's core values are one, leadership in innovation and technology, two, culture of excellence, three, diversity and equal opportunity, and finally, integrity and stewardship of resource. For KUST, these values must be upheld consistently and effectively. This typifies the pressure of higher education institutions to meet the needs of their biggest clients, the students, alongside the parents, guardians, and agencies that pay their fees. Higher education, as Chancellor Nobles emphasized in her public lecture on Thursday, must produce holistic graduates that not contribute positively to the growth of the economy only, but also lead their nations into prosperity. University administrations must administer education of the highest quality to an ever more teeming number of students. Lecturers and teaching staff are not just expected to be educators, but also mentors with a very great human touch. Higher education research must now answer very pressing and complex questions with godlike accuracy because of how core they are to the very existence of humanity. This means that AI and emerging technologies have come at such a crucial time to deliver on these great expectations. As affirmative, we are not blind to the disruption AI and emerging tech present 
which is normal for new technology. This still stays aligned with most research agendas in the field, such as the National Artificial Intelligence Research and Development Strategic Plan, released by the US President Barack Obama in October 2016 to ethically use AI for social and economic benefits. We have real in KUST doing the same. A new world is being birthed and higher education has a permanent role to play in shaping it and preparing students for it. Two arguments in substantive. The first, education 4.0. The second, higher education research. First, education 4.0. Students who have different rates of learning and diverse challenges are expected to turn up during exams and deliver their best. This is a huge source of anxiety for them. According to Siolaku Ektao, AI plays a key role in Education 4.0 in improving the quality of learning. It assists professors in identifying the drivers of students' performance and their weaknesses, adopting a personalized student model on the basis of their knowledge level, utilizing adaptive learning systems through AI to provide predictive models, and moreover, monitoring students' progress over their curriculum. Imagine text such as virtual reality adds to this. So imagine, if you will, a world where the enigma of complex equations becomes a captivating dance of visualizations and simulations, where abstract theories morph into interactive realities, inviting students to actively participate in the unraveling of mysteries, nurturing a deep-seated understanding that transcends rote memorization. Why is this important? AI and emerging technologies breathe life into textbooks, transforming them into gateways to boundless Points. exploration, igniting the flames of curiosity that burn brighter than ever before. The, immense, the impacts are immense. These technologies facilitate the connection of minds across vast distances, fostering vibrant communities of knowledge seekers. The human touch, far from being diminished, becomes elevated as educators embrace their roles as mentors and guides, infusing empathy and wisdom into the very fabric of digital interactions to make their students better every day. An exemplary case study that supports these ideas is Jill Watson, IBM's AI teaching assistant at Georgia Tech. Jill Watson successfully managed several classes, including graduates, undergraduates, online and residential courses, by handling mundane and routine tasks Jill Watson amplified the reach of teachers, allowing them to engage with students on a deeper level. The students testified about the insignificant improvements made in their learning, ultimately voting Jill Watson as the best teaching assistant in the university. This case study demonstrates the transformative impact AI and emerging tech have on education, enhancing student-teacher interactions, and Point. fostering a more effective and engaging learning environment. Before that, I'll take side negative. The difference between these revolutions and the one before is that those revolutions depended on human ex experience and intelligence. Why should the revolution that replaces your intelligence be a revolution that is a blessing to you? The human element is never lost in this world, primarily with regards to breaking new ground. The data generated is one that needs human beings to be at the forefront of it. Without the human beings, there is no data for the AI to work with. That is the point. Secondly, higher education research. AI-powered tools revolutionize research by liberating us from mundane and time-consuming tasks, while also fueling remarkable breakthroughs and creative discoveries that would otherwise take decades to achieve. Ladies and gentlemen, we are confronted with critical challenges that demand urgent attention. According to the World Health Organization, millions of lives are lost each year due to cancer and bacterial infections because we lack effective cures, natural disasters like tsunamis because of insufficient warning systems, and pollution because of the ever increasing reliance on fossil fuels. Additionally, the exponential growth of our population has driven the need for exploring colonization of other planets. Addressing these existential problems requires a significant leap in science and technology, necessitating an interdisciplinary approach and the use of AI tools to unravel their complexities. There are multiple examples to support this. First, in healthcare, the filariasis research team at KCCR KUST is leveraging AI to combat ochocerciasis also known as river blindness, which affects over 20.9 million people globally, according to the Center of Disease Control. 
By employing AI, the team has enhanced the effectiveness of their research efforts and found innovative solutions. Scientists at McMaster and MIT used an AI model to identify an antibiotic to combat Asymptobacter bomani, a pathogen that the World Health Organization labeled as one of the most dangerous antibiotic-resistant bacteria for hospital patients. In clean energy, Google's DeepMind has developed a remarkable AI model capable of controlling plasma in nuclear fusion. We are ever closer to a future powered by clean and renewable energy sources. These advancements are being done through research and AI. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, let these words resonate in your minds and hearts. Collaboration, not competition. Renewal, not replacement. Together, we shape a future where the pursuit of knowledge transcends barriers, where innovation and imagination Thank intertwine, you. and where Thank the transformative you. power of technology illuminates a path to a brighter and more enlightened world of higher learning. This blessing we must affirm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Master Dennis Atisu, for opening the case for the affirmative. It's important that debaters take POIs. POIs are point of information. At any point in time within the speech, if you have a question, you can ask the debater on the floor. He has a discretion to admit your question or not. If you have the chance to ask the POI, you are admonished to make it very sharp and direct. Maximum 10 seconds probably 15, 15 seconds, and then he would answer it, at which time his time will be paused to take it because of the movement of the microphone. So debaters, kindly take POIs. And the audience is also encouraged to ask POI. Not only the debaters can ask, anyone can ask a POI. All right, thank you very much. So we would invite the first speaker on the negative side, Master Kodre Champon, to open their case. Person, Professor Miss Rita Sophia Dixon, um, standing on already established protocol, I would like to first recognize and appreciate my parents for showing up for their young man as usual. I love you too so much. I'll begin my submission by explaining two things. First, the way in which the debate is supposed to be evaluated, and second, the way in which higher education works. First, on evaluation of the debate, we are not going to argue here we will be challenging affirmative on the overall impact of their benefits to the advancement of the core principles of higher education. We would be explaining the extent to which AI, as, um, to which AI benefits us and the trade-off that we would have to make to achieve all of those benefits they talk about. This becomes a better way of voting on the debate as opposed to numerical benefits because if their benefits come at the cost of the fundamental principles of education, then it is a net negative sum which makes AI in emerging technology a curse. The second thing is on how does higher education operate. Most education researchers opine that the core product of education is the development of its human capital. This manifests in the depth of knowledge and contribution of its researchers, faculty and students alike, and how they are able to lead the pursuit of change in their communities. To that extent, higher education can be said to have three aspects. One, the education, two, research, and three, societal and industrial benefits. Our arguments are going to prove why AI and emerging tech are um, a case in these three fields. On education, our claim is that learning is a social activity and so requires interaction beyond the classroom and even during the classroom. AI in emerging technology, like they rightly point out, limits this particular inter interaction as it gives students more unique ways and personal ways of studying to that particular regard. If they want mentorship, they should encourage um, students to engage with their lecturers, not to engage with AI that are usually efficient. The advent of AI and emerging technology in the fourth and fifth industrial revolution has seen the creation of generative pre-trained models and large language models that can give definite answers to a wide array of questions in any academic field. 
Affirmative claims, and we agree that this would ensure personalized and remote learning regimes, which makes it easier for students to understand and study at their own convenience. The extent to which you believe this to be true is the extent you need to believe us when we say that students would not engage with faculty and their peers would be engaging with this particular AI to that particular extent, unless they would want to argue that students would have the AI and they would not use the AI and they would still engage with faculty and their peers. It is worth noting that already most students hardly engage with faculty and peers, and so several um, research has been put into ensuring that there is much engagement with faculty and peers in that particular regard. When there is a tool that gives you the opt-out of this particular engagement and they argue that students are going to use it, you limit academic interaction and that becomes important because it hurts their own mentorship argument and it's something that you should vote against in today's debate. I think this becomes a case particularly because per the social-cultural education theory of Soviet psychologist Lev Vygotsky, he posits that human development in education is as a result of the subliminal ways in which we interact with our peers and faculty. This has become particularly important to higher education because now more than ever, we would want to ensure diversity in our classrooms to ensure that people are able to collaborate academically so that they will be able to get, generate all the benefits that we want for our side. If you have a diverse class and we encourage students to use AI, you are not making use of that particular diversity and so it is a curse and not a blessing in that particular regard. If you think that academic interaction between peers and faculty is good, then we need to agree with us that let us have more of it as opposed to the other side that decreases it. Even if it's by a percentage, it becomes a curse and it becomes something that we need to check. When we collaborate on You're virtual right. platforms, at the point where the focus is not on how we can brainstorm and learn about how everyone within the group think and how we can get answers and help one another become very important people for, cl um, for cross-disciplinary um, projects as well as intradisciplinary projects. This means that in the world of AI, the purpose of group works becomes focused on inputting prompts and waiting to get answers so that you can regurgitate them You're as right. opposed to challenging yourself and challenging your ideas, knowing more about yourself academically and improving in that particular field. Before I move on to research, I'll take a PI from the audience. So there can be group work that the lecturers can give to students and they can still interact in. How is that not diversity or engaging in a social interaction? The point of that interaction would not be challenging your peers, would not be challenging your faculty or discussing with them because you have AI that can answer the question that you would have otherwise asked your peer. You would ask the AI, and if they want to argue that people would not ask the AI, then we cannot have this debate. They need to accept that people would ask the AI because the AI is efficient. Now, moving on to research. Research in higher education can be grouped into two. The first being research carried out by doctors and professors who have knowledge and experience in conducting research, and the second being research carried by undergraduates and inexperienced researchers that hope to grow in the field. I'd like to comment on the latter because it is where the implementation of AI has the most harm and also because that is the future of research which we want to shape. Higher education bears the responsibility of training the next generation of researchers to do research and even contribute to research technology. Our claim is that the use of AI analytics for data analysis, citations, summaries, and literature review strips inexperienced and undergraduate researchers from the opportunity on learning how to do these things on their own. And this is how it manifests. It is true because the pursuit of rapid result-oriented research departments, like Affirmative would want to argue, would most likely focus on teaching its students the use of AI tools as opposed to building their personal capacity to be able to develop these methods on their own. And this becomes particularly important because you have, I mean, you have limited time to teach students, and you have to choose between a method that Affirmative says is slow, which is your own human capacity, and a method that Affirmative says is faster. I think it's most obvious that you have to prioritize the faster method by using AI. I'll take the PUI from the young man there. Thank you for giving the opportunity to ask this question. Please, if I may ask, what is AIA? So AI is um, artificial intelligence, and then they symbolize the new generation 
of computers that has been trained to be able to act and function on its own as opposed to the traditional way of computing where it relied or computers relied on human efforts to be able to produce results. It's modeled after the human brain and so it can function on its own just as you are able to function on its own. It can debate like you are doing. It can lead an university like our VC is doing and it can ask a question like you just did. So I would continue. POI. Um, I'm not taking more, any more POIs. I want to wrap up my speech. So to continue with the point on um, research, this means that the future generation of researchers would be able to use AI tools to fast track research, but then it comes at the cost of not having an in-depth individual academic capacity to be as efficient researchers as our esteemed doctors and professors who are sitting here are because they were made to develop their own individual capacity to be able to do all of the things that the next generation of education would focus on teaching students to use AI to do. The last note I engage on to conclude is whether AI can probably, um, properly be regulated to mitigate the issues that we will be presenting on our side. I want to make two claims. The first being that repetitive paraphrasing and other methods that I would not like our examiners here to know have proven to reduce the efficiency of AI detectors that are now um, springing up. University of Maryland researchers just this June released a paper that concluded that the state of the art detectors that use watermarking, zero shorting, and retrieval based models cannot reliably detect the outputs of large language models in practical scenarios. The second claim is that to the extent where each iteration of AI keeps on getting more advanced and smarter, means that they are able to produce more human like text. To that particular extent, AI models, AI detection models, would end up even classifying the new human um, work as probably AI generated, or they would not be able to sufficiently distinguish between AI generated um, work and then human generated um, work. This poses serious stress to students who even were ethical in the use of the AI and equally to examiners in the pursuit of regulation. It is worth noting that even this is in relation to research that has to be written and presented so that we can submit it. What about oral research and group studies like she talks about? How would we be able to determine whether this work is human and this work or even this debate or this speech that I'm reading is by my own efforts, my own intellect or generated by an AI just this morning? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while they argue that industry is growing and need to produce more in record time to meet the growing demand to meet the growing demand of solutions um, of problems and equally its constituents and clients, higher education need not to bow down to this particular um, pressure because like we identify, their core principle is the development and usage of human capital and they only do that through in-depth human academic interaction. For more academic interaction, for more individual capacity building, for more mentorship, you have to vote team negative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kojo, for that speech. So both sides of the debate have been opened. We have preliminary speeches from each team. We will now invite the second speaker on the affirmative side to repair their case. Hello. Before I begin my speech, I'd like to dedicate this speech to my mom for her endless support for me. The, chair the chairperson, university registrar, special guest, permits me to stand on the already existing protocols to begin this debate. Growth is painful, change is painful, but nothing is as painful as staying stuck and not evolving. Even animals evolved, human evolving shouldn't be the bone of contention in today's debate. Today's debate is a process versus outcome debate. 
What it means is that the process is us using emerging technology and artificial intelligence. It's using emerging technology and artificial intelligence. That outcome is what we see in status school. Is this something we should term as a blessing or something we should term as a curse? However, before I move on, let's do a few engagements to what the negative says. So the negative boiled down on three things. One, they spoke about how interaction does not exist in our world. Panel, recognize that the fact that we use emerging technology and AI to engage in the pursuit of higher education does not mean that people are not going to be socialized. Things such as group work still exist. Things such as project work still exist. Things such as group assignments and presentations still exist at the end of the day, and there's still going to be a certain level of interaction among students at the end of the day. They perceive a world as if no one is going to have any form of interaction, and that is something that is very, very problematic, right? But the next thing they tell you is about how there are no regulations to regulate AI, right? Note that AI is an evolving um, phenomenon. UI. It means that hold on, I'll take you. It means that as time goes on, you're able to see the excesses of it and create regulations in order to mitigate the harms that has, it has brought to us in status school. So for example, when China realized that there was overpopulation, right, what they did was be able to um, create policies to be able to ensure that that doesn't exist at the end of the day. And we think that with AI, we are going to be able to do that. So things like plagiarism wouldn't be existing because there are code of ethics that ensure that you don't plagiarize the work even though you use certain AI instruments to be able to get your pursuits of education, right? What's the next case we bring to you in today's debate? One, we talk to you about the discrimination gap that AI and emerging technology brings in the pursuit of higher education. A subset of students that has not been tackled in today's debate is individuals who pursue higher education but have certain level of disabilities. What does this mean? When people are pursuing education, it's not everyone that actually is the normal human being at the end of the day. We have people of disabilities that want to pursue higher education, right? People with disabilities are unable to pursue higher education because of the certain structures that inhibit them at the end of the day. But with the realization of AI and emerging technology, we have things such as the machine learning, which enables you to be able to learn regardless of the disability you have. Professor M. Esmeralda Marfo, the head of the Kane West Social Work Association, said, and I paraphrase, there is a need to reorient lecturers and students about persons with disabilities. Why orient students and lecturers when AI can actually do the work and actually even do it better at the end of the day? What does machine learning exactly do to tailor people who have disabilities in, in pursuing higher education? So right. machine learning produces things like content descriptions, which aid students who are legally blind or have low visions. But secondly, it creates models and also guides individuals to a certain level of, with, and also guides individuals who have certain level of hearing impairment. At best, let's use K University as a case study. What K University does for students with disabilities is to provide them things like a special shuttle which transports them to and from lectures and probably a hostel. But they do not address the specific needs of these individuals. So if a disabled person can't see in class, that person is lacking. If the disabled person cannot hear something in class, that person is lacking. We don't have needs to address the specific problems of these disabled individuals who want to pursue higher education. But with machine learning, which is a component of yeah. artificial intelligence, even if you have a visual impairment or a hearing impairment, it's structured in such a way that it fits your personality, it fits your disability, and you're able to pursue that education at the end of the day. So like, you can't come and argue that it's already exists in status quo. It doesn't exist in status quo at the end of the day. That is why my lecturer will still close their class and teach one guy again, because obviously whatever he said during the two hours, didn't get into his head because he has a disability. We think that AI is something that makes work much more easier at the end of the day, and that is something we should um, boil down right. to, right? With weighing on accessibility, right, we break the shackles of barriers which has been restored on individuals due to the lottery of birth, because obviously they didn't wish to be born with these disabilities, and that is something that you should prioritize. Our world is a world whereby we give people much more inclusion, much more diversity, because we don't segregate people because of how the structure is able to accommodate you, Point. regardless of your background. You're able to learn at your pace and it's something that we should prioritize. I take you. Your first speaker said it is for renewal and not replacement. In your speech, you interact with the replacement of lecturers and students. What exactly is machine learning going to do? Supposedly, a deaf student was sitting among us. So, with machine, um, so this is it. We are not replacing the work. It serves as a complementary aid and tools for you to be able to pursue higher education. So if there's a deaf student in class, machine learning is able to create certain models for you to be able to hear whatever is happening at the end of the day. It's able to create certain models for you to be able to understand in your own language as a deaf person. That is something that does not exist 
without AI at the end of the day, and that is something that you should know. So we realize that, when, like you're a tech guy, you should know this better. <laughs> now, moving to the second case in today's debate, right? Like, the next thing we talk to you about, panel, is about the industrial benefits we bring into society, right? There is a popular narrative in status quo, and that, what's the negative is, and that is what the negative is capitalizing on, to entrench and nudge your emotions towards them because you hate the idea and you are probably scared. The narrative we have in status quo is that, oh, AI is going to take away our jobs and render you and I jobless at the end of the day, so there's no need for us to pursue. What I'll do in my fifth minute is to argue to you the flip side of it, how AI is actually going to create more jobs to us and is never going to leave us unemployed at the end of the day, right? But the truth is this, right? In case you didn't know, if your government is terrible, it means you will be jobless. They will freeze your employment. If you are not skilled enough, it means you will also be jobless. But how does AI and emerging technology specifically address this problem of unemployment, right? We think that AI is not necessarily taking away your jobs. It's rather complementing these jobs. And even if it takes away their jobs, we think that humans need to upskill to meet the ever-evolving world of AI and technology. The good news here is that you and I, stood, you and I precisely students, are as ignorant as ever to the knowledge that enable us to be relevant. So it looks like jobs like machine managers, data detectives, AI auditors, etc. will be in demand. So what you have to do is be able to reorient yourself so that you are going to stay relevant into the system. So in as much as it's taking away probably administrative roles, it's also giving us roles in, what, in software engineering. So as an individual, you have to reorient yourself to meet the ever-demanding nature of it, right? But it is worthy to note that according to the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report, 97 million jobs will be created by 2025 due to AI and emerging technology. However, certain jobs will still remain relevant. Jobs such as being a surgeon, AI hasn't developed there yet to be able to con um, like perform a surgery. Jobs such as building constructions, AI cannot do that possibly. Jobs such as midwifery, midwives, I mean, AI possibly cannot deliver a baby. Let's be realistic over here and not buy into their world and saying that AI is obviously going to take away every single job. Like, that can't really exist. We had so many revolutions. The Green Revolution, which took away jobs, it still replaced jobs. The Industrialized Revolution, which took away jobs, it still replaced jobs. The Digitalized Evolution, which took away jobs, it still replaced jobs. Even the VC has a secretary. Why does it she have an AI there performing her administrative roles at the end of the day. Like, let's be realistic and not paint a picture that these things are going to, like, take away everything. Let's not exaggerate today's debate, right? What you get from us from side negative, from, like, just this um, 60 minutes of our speech. We were able to, to posit to you that there is a need to ensure that AI and emerging technologies help in the pursuit of our education at the end of the day. It is a buffer. It is complementing you to be able to ensure that you are much more effective. It is not taking away anything from you. If you are redundant, it means you don't want to upskill yourself as an individual and you are not to blame AI. Probably blame your laziness at the end of the day. It's about time we embrace a new dawn. AI and emerging technology ensures effectiveness and ability. The future of humanity rests on the ability to harness knowledge. And AI is one that ensures that regardless of your background, regardless of your lottery of birth, you are able to pursue and climb the academic ladder of higher education as compared to status quo and as compared to these guys where they say that everything is going to be taken away from you. Oh. Even if jobs are going to be taken away from us, I've already shown to you how they have been three revolutions. Precedent shows that we still have jobs regardless of the three revolutions that have existed. And that is something we should pride in today's debate. We cannot have a debate whereby we say we are not going to um, buy into our world. When voting, cast your mind back to how many times AI and chat GPT have actually helped you when you don't understand things that your lecturer teaches you in class. I don't go to diplomacy class, but I was still able to get an A because I have AI, proudly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that speech. People from the audience, university staff, our dignitaries are all encouraged to ask POIs. And kindly notice that you can ask the POI after one minute, after, uh, after one minute of the speaker starting the speech and then one minute before they end the speech. So second minute to the seventh minute. In the last minute, you may not ask a POI. So we would invite the next speaker from the negative side to give the last engagement in this round. Then we will come to the audience and take an audience engagement and get back to the speakers again. So the next speaker from the 
negative side, Miss Yudia. And it's important to notice that Miss Yudia is a first year student. Before I like to begin, I would like to thank the Debating Society for giving me this opportunity to be part of such a program as a first year student. And to my dad for making it a point to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, so. The chairperson, university registrar, special guests, provosts of colleges, deans and directors, heads of departments, members of convocation, senior and junior staff, the clergy, alumni, students, the media, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis mentions problems like tsunamis, healthcare, and says that those are things that need AI to solve, and we concede to that. We tell you that we think that it is fine for AI to be used in the industry. However, what we are concerned about is the impact in higher education, which is today's debate. The problem with what Nanaya said in her response to AI and disabled people is that by doing what she, she posits, you make the disabled people more disconnected to everyone else, right? Instead of being able, instead of, instead of sorry, able people and disabled people to collaborate together, now disabled people would only communicate with AI. If this was a good idea, the School of Medicine and Dentistry wouldn't require their students to learn sign language in their first year. Now, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Remember that the debate today on AI is in respect to higher education, which means that there are a number of stakeholders, and the major ones are the students, the faculty, the institution, and the society at large. Now, Negative is going to show you why, in consideration of all this, we think that AI and emerging technologies is a case to higher education in respect to university degrees and the future of the job market, academic interactivity, and research. Now, whenever there's the talk of AI taking over jobs, there are usually two responses. either. AI will create jobs for the people running them, or AI cannot take away service jobs, or jobs that require emotional intelligence. But here's the reality. Businessinsider.com lists accounting, banking, and finance as most likely to be taken over. Other jobs that AI and emerging technology can and is easily doing as of today include data analysis, creative writing, coding, among others. Google found in theory that they would rather hire a robot to code for them over a human being who interviewed at their company. Amazon employees tested ChatGPT and found out that it does a great job of answering customer service questions than some of their own employees. In fact, MIT professor Rosalind Pickard suggests that the evolution of AI systems suggests the evolution of AI systems into integrating human emotions to the point that now even AI can perform surgeries. Esteemed audience, realize that the need for humans to man AI systems is only because AI is still developing, like they say. This means that at the peak of the evolution of AI, there will be no need to employ humans anymore. So the jobs that they say AI will create will cease to exist. How does this affect higher education? Because for new entrants, like the JHS students, who is thinking of his future job, and the SHS students over here, who some of them are currently filling their forms, they'll be thinking about career path to choose that will ensure that their lives are more comfortable in future. This means that, for example, the KNFC School of Business is going to have less applicants because they now think that AI is taking over the jobs in the finance industry. Because of this, they'll be focused on learning a new skill set, one that they think is safe from the AI takeover. The problem with is that when a particular skill set becomes highly wanted, its value goes up, and therefore it becomes expensive to acquire it. And also, because the number of skills that are free are relatively minimal, that expertise will eventually become saturated and highly competitive. This is why the whole response of AI won't take over, every job is contentious, because the jobs that will be left behind will not be sufficient for the numerous people in the world who all, mind you, have different interests and talents. Now, another thing is that now that these potential students are straying away from certain fields and going majorly into others, those fields that will be left behind are not going to be prioritized in terms of funding, meaning they'll be deficient with regards to numbers comparison to other fields that would have people entering into them. Consequently, some fields will outgrow others because of lack of funds and human beings in terms of research. No POI, continuing. 
So on Thursday, Chancellor Melissa Nobles touched on the need for academic interactivity and interdisciplinary cooperation. This is because it comes off of a realization that in our inadequacies, we need to become beneficial to one another. A centralized repository of interdisciplinary knowledge, which AI seeks to provide, reduces incentives to collaborate and have such, and have such pertinent conversations. We need to build communities, and communities cannot be built in an environment that is more and more dependent on technology. Your professor, Nicholas Christakis, supports this with his research that he did, where he projected that inadvertently, AI and emerging technology will alter human capacity for altruism, connections, and will put human ability of engagement, critical thinking, development of social and emotional skills at risk. POI. In most universities like the KNUST, People are not taught only in one course. That is to say, if AI takes over your business course, you can go into something like sociology. But we are curious, which AI currently can perform a surgery? Because I'm sure, just like everyone else, we don't know of any one AI. Some, some of these things, right, I cannot tell you for you to believe unless you watch videos and do research yourself, right? But then if you do do the research, you realize that there actually is AI that can perform surgery. Continuing. One of the things that KNUST prides itself on is collaborative and relevant research. And for this value to be up, one of the things that KNUST prides itself on is collaborative and relevant research. And for this value to be upheld, we need to critically assess how AI and emerging technology will affect this. In the picture that affirmative paints to us is that with AI and emerging technology, there will be no need for research and one that is collaborative yeah. at that. Why? Because the value of research is embedded in its difficulty and the ability to overcome limitations to do that research. With the use of AI systems, the need for such collaborative interactions would cease to Point. exist because this complex nature of traditional research is taken away by AI. The beautiful elements of cooperation and partnerships will be lost. The worth of peer reviews then significantly goes down because with the employment of AI and emerging technology in research, the amount, I'll take you in a bit, the amount of articles waiting in line would have tripled. Same for the ones that are being published. Peer reviewers will now be less strict to accommodate the vast numbers. Unless affirmative tells us that well, then they'll start to use AI for peer reviews, which would be another debacle on its own. The POI now. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so please, you pointed out in your discussion Sorry, that... Sorry, I cannot hear you. All right, thank you. You pointed out in your discussion that artificial intelligence, some such as the artificial super intelligence can perform surgery. And then in that case, I would like to ask that is it not a benefit to our society if we have an invention that can secure our health? That's a good question. However, it's not in the scope of my submission. One of my speakers would explain that in their submission. If we all agree that AI systems is still evolving, how are they so sure that the end product of that evolution will not be catastrophic? All protocols duly observed, just because a method is easier does not mean it is the best and the most suitable. Taking a look at the vision and mission of KNUSC, which generally pushes for holistic education and relevant research, we believe that AI and emerging technology would actually derail that. Ladies and gentlemen, part of the reasons why you would appreciate today's debate is that KNUSC gave its students, it gave me, a first year student, the opportunity to collaborate, research, and train for this debate. What if I didn't do any of this research and training? What if all this, the speech I just gave and the references I just used was generated by AI this morning before I came here? Would Professor Dixon be proud to say at the next graduation that she has a team of debaters who are critical thinkers? Would it support Professor Noble's vision for students, which she summarized as being able to think for themselves, think critically, and be intellectually curious? That is the difference between higher education and the industry. Producing results with AI and emerging technology at the industry level is perhaps a blessing, but producing results in higher education with AI and emerging Point. technology is a case that none of us would be proud of. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Idia, for that speech. And I would plead, kind of technicians, please check on the microphones for us. All right. So at this point, we've heard from two speakers on each side of the debate. 
we now come to the audience for audience engagement. You're going to be part of the debate. You have the opportunity to tell us what you think and engage each other. You can also engage the particular debate that has happened on the stage. And we would encourage as many people as possible to participate. Because you're working with just 15 minutes in this session, we would wish that you make your arguments very concise, you go straight to the point, and get them directed at the specific things you want to talk about. So let's try to make it quite easy. Um, can we get five people who want to speak for the motion that AI is a blessing? All right, can you, can you come forward? Just five. Then five who would like to speak against the motion. So those who think that it's a blessing, you can be at this side. And those who think that it's a curse can be at this side. I don't want to think that you're going to have five against one. <laughs> All right, so if you want to speak that AI is a curse, kindly join this side. So blessing, curse. How many people do we have? Five? All right, that's fine. We can still have the engagement. It doesn't necessarily need to be balanced. We can have a balance of thoughts without a balance in numerical. All right. So in this session, I will be actually streamlining the thoughts that we'll be getting from them. So, is the microphone working? Yes, on. Hi. Hi. All right. So, you're speaking on the fact Hello. that AI remains a curse to higher education. AI is a blessing to higher education. Is that okay? All right. So, let's hear from the affirmative first. Who goes first? Um, hello? Okay. Yeah. So, my name is Jeffrey Ozue Chow. I'm also a first year debater. Um, now, basically, what I want to ask, or what I want to say, is that the people who are pushing for the CARES ideology or the CARES narrative of AI come to preach a certain diversity that comes with the in-person learning um, model with the university students, faculty, etc. However, um, with the university or the interactive university model, in which people who get different ideas from different people and preach diversity, we can also preach the same for the side of AI because the knowledge that is inputted in AI comes from an, a diverse array of professors, doctorate holders, PhD holders, researchers, etc. So if I'm getting it for a more reliable source, or from a more patient source, or from a more less stigmatizing source, then why should I resort to the one that is going to um, basically uh, implore me to go to a certain extreme to be able to get my answers, which may even be unreliable to that extent. All right, so his argument is speaking to the issue of diversity. It's been argued in this debate that AI takes away and does not use the diversity, cross-cultural diversity, and other diversity considerations that we have within higher education. He says that we should pay attention to the nuances that exist that the kind of knowledge base that AI uses in its inherent algorithm comes from broad spectrum sources. So we have diverse views converging within the AI system. So at the end of the day, whatever output that AI is producing is already diverse. That's particularly what he's saying. And given that AI is quite efficient as compared to humans, why is it the case that we are against this? All right, Joyce, you want to take on. All right, and it's important to note that Joyce is the current public speaking champion, Pan-African Universities debates. All right, also from KNUST. Thank you very much, the chair of the house. Um, so first of all, I think the idea of diversity in its basic form is the idea of having different people from various cultural backgrounds. If I am Ife, and I sit with an Akan, and, we, and, and, and again with a Fancy, and all of us come together to use ChatGPT, that in of itself is a sort of diversity which we are collaborating in that instance. Therefore, that fundamental idea of diversity 
is not lost and AI is not taking that away. But then secondly, recognize that the idea of diversity has had a lot of barriers because of um, various stereotypes against it. In a world where we don't even have to, we go, we transcend these barriers and use a common tool for our own educational purposes, then again, that diversity is rather improved. My submission is first of all on the idea of like the idea of AI and then how it can be like a case or not necessarily right. Recognize that that diversity as we talk about, we have to transcend those stereotypes as I've talked about. In a world where just the common tool is AI, we would not have those interactions with each other to know about those stereotypes and those barriers. Because as we sit even in a group work, we are only concentrating on something, not letting someone else speak up. That is to say, that expression that we can get from, um, from a personal interaction is lost. But then secondly, on the idea of the industry and resources, recognize that indeed, even if it is just constrained to the higher education, we are still learning things that in the outside world are going to be our industries. For example, I'm studying media and communication studies. I'd want to be a prolific writer and that is in the industry. If an AI is doing that for Joy News or TV3, where do I stand? Thank you. All right, thank you. So, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey. So, in line with that argument, what's the their site says is that higher education is seeking to re-engineer society in a society where existential oppression is, is, is an issue, discrimination and all of that. And we're trying to create a safe space within academic societies and academic communities. That's why universities across the world are trying to have cross-cultural diversity. So you bring people together to interact and all that. They say, the particular use of AI to a significant extent creates less incentive for the kind of collaboration that will yield the interaction that is the goal. How do you respond to this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do agree with her point to an extent because I do believe that there are majorly other avenues that can push for these um, socializations which she speaks of or which she preaches. I believe that forcing someone or forcing a group of people to socialize in the first place goes against the main agenda which you are seeking for or which you are pushing for. If you want um, an Akan and an Ever and let's say a Fanti to socialize or to come together on a point and you have to force them to be in the same class in order to get them to do that, then maybe aren't you going against the main agenda that you are pushing for in the first place? That is my question to the other side. Um, All right. Wait, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to cut you off. But primarily, again, in the university society, there are other avenues such as, um, let's say, socialization events, um, which provide like more friendlier avenues. Because if we are in class, it's an intimidating space as compared to, let's say, a place where we are allowed to let's loose and be ourselves other than a class which is more professional and like stringent. Yep, All right. Yeah. Thank you. So let's hear from the next person. Quickly thank enough. Yeah, so I think this debate is about advantages and disadvantages of AI and emerging technologies. And I believe the advantages overweigh the disadvantages. We know in um, time past, we had uh, huge computers and they thought it was fine. They were able to work with, even before the evolution of computers, they didn't have anything and then they were working tirelessly and they thought they were okay. But when computers came, they thought that, okay, we can get this aid and work was being faster. Computers have evolved. We have smartphones that we use for everything and our lives are better, right? We are still working. We still have jobs. Let me tell you, previously, even if not COVID, yeah, we know that COVID is, is a pandemic and all, but it came as a blessing in disguise because we have an online streaming where people all over the world are not here, but also partaking in this debate. So the advantage of AI and emerging technologies far outweighs the disadvantages. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We take the next person from okay. the side. Um, I'm Sam Wormensafrins in MPhil Sociology. And uh, before I make my submission, I want to... Kindly speak in the microphone. I'm Sam Wormensafrins in MPhil Sociology. Before I make my submission, I want to clarify uh, a term used in their submissions. Um, instead of disabled persons, 
Uh, it's largely recommended we use persons uh, with disabilities or people with disability. And uh, moving on, I feel AI is a case. Um, is a case because it undermines practical research experience in university or in uh, educational institutions. We are here to be trained, and then as part of the training process, you are supposed to acquire research skills. And AI, uh, depending on AI, undermines that practical experience you can have on the field. You can have AI generating certain results, but then what is the consequence of that result? How can we feel what is actually on the ground? So I feel AI undermines practical research experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a good submission. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Alexander. I'm a teaching assistant here. Um, so first of all, um, to give a general information to everybody about AI, um, specifically when they said AI was being used in surgery and the guy said we should point out an AI that's being used in surgery, right? Um, AI is not only the macro AI that we see that um, is being employed like chat GPT, which is general purpose. We don't only have AI like that, right? We have AI that deals with specific issues. So you can have a surgical tool that is taking in, using computer vision, taking in stuff from the environment and making calculations accurate to pinpoint where the disease is to remove that particular disease, right? It's aiding the surgeon, but it has not completely taken over the whole surgery. So there are AI tools that, have, that are in there that are not taking completely over the whole surgery process, right? So that's just for, by the way. Now, when we come to the field of education, when we come to education, right? Education evolves, right? Everything, every process in this world that we have, we have come to know started from a point and has evolved to this point. When medicine started off, they were curing these um, infections, blood infections with bloodletting. You would cut yourself and let out your blood, thinking that that would cure the disease. But we learned and we advanced, and medicine has evolved past that, right? Not to say that it didn't take away jobs from um, those medi uh, medical personnel at the time. They just had to learn how to employ the new innovations that have been made in the field to improve upon that. Right? So AI is not going to take away from sociology. I think last Thursday, I asked the question um, um, to Professor Nobles about um, how to integrate sociology, how to introduce people within sociology to AI tools, because it will make their work easier, not take over the field. So I think that is one thing that we should keep in mind. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting submission. Next person. Try to make your submissions very brief direct, concise. Hello everyone, I'm Dennis Kwame Sawahinfo and I'm also a first year debater. Now why I think AI is a curse in and of itself is because it defeats the main goal of higher education. What does higher education seek to do? It seeks to be a preserver, disseminator of knowledge and help breed certain ideas that are going to advocate for certain social changes. Why do I think that AI is not going to do this? Now, we should all know that AI is an intelligent system and when it reaches its peak, human beings will tend to over depend on this AI because then they will, be, come, they, they will lead, it will lead to this kind of incessant intuition that the AI is smarter than, than them. So they will not want to think and actually do things for themselves because there's an intelligent system out there. What does this mean for higher education? It means that they will come to a point where human beings will not be able to think critically on their own and actually generate ideas that are very unique. It means that the university, first of all, will not be able to preserve certain knowledge because AI acts on certain popular opinions and will only give you what, in general, people will want to hear. So it means that certain pieces of knowledge that were once existing will be lost over time. Second of all, the, human, uh, the university will not be able to disseminate knowledge in of itself because as I said, certain knowledge will be lost, and so not every kind of knowledge will be able to be shared with everyone, because the less popular their opinion is, the less it will be actually be given to you. And third, since there's no unique ideas or certain kind of innovation that can come out to actually facilitate um, social change, it means that in the long run, the university's aim of existing in of itself has not been achieved. So I think AI actually does not help the university AI in itself counteracts the main existence of higher education in of itself. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. The next person. Okay, sure. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Kelly Jamana, and then I'm a final year computer science student. 
So I listened to a point from the negative side, and then they spoke about the fact that research is meant to be difficult. You need to pass through the qualms of research before we know that this research that you've undertaken is a research, in quotes. But I would want to put across that is the bone of contention about the fact that a research is meant to be difficult or uh, the purpose of a research is in its findings. Because, for instance, if I am a final year student and then we are carrying out our final year project, you as a human would have to define your project scope, your purpose, before you look out for the data, the research findings which are already existing. That is where AI comes into play. So we cannot undermine the fact that we need AI in our research. And then this is the moment where we need AI the most. Because as a technology institution, where sometimes getting data for your research sometimes becomes difficult. All right. So let me ask you this. In higher education where you're training students, particularly undergraduate students, we are supposed to acquire research skills. The real risk is that there is an incentive to cut corners and use the shortcuts to get this research done. So for example, having AI large language models to generate things for them. What that means is that students do not really acquire the relevant skills that they need in the further academic journey. But then also specific to certain researchers. It means that the um, ability to interpret based on lived experience and practical experiences is so missing because AIs, to some extent, do not give you that nuance-specific interpretation. But then again, also, there are certain researches that can be heavily facilitated by AI and those that cannot. You gradually risk approaching the trend where certain research areas receive less attention because they become very difficult to do. How do you respond to that? We, we cannot make the general conclusion that uh, because we would have to carry, students would have to go through the mill of carrying their own research. We cannot make the general conclusion that AI would make certain research areas uh, less, less taken up by students. But the point I'm trying to make is sometimes you need data. And then in getting data for your research, you do not have to go through all the way of sometimes getting data. You have to travel all the way from KNUSU to Tamale to pick yeah. your data sets. Yeah, so to, that works to, for students who need data, special yes. data that they will not get. Yes. But the truth is, students who do not fall into this category would also use it. Respond to that. For students who would also use, for students who would also use AI in their research, it would help facilitate the research because you have a pool of knowledge from all other sources that you can get at your beck and call. So this is where AI comes to facilitate the research that you are doing, and you do not have to necessarily duplicate the already existing research, which is which is. All right, that's a there. fair response. Thank all right, you. let's take the next person. How many people left here? Two. Two. All right. Quickly enough. My name is Prospera Idibeta from KNUST SHS. So the opposer said that AI does not cause us to lose our jobs, but rather propels us to reorient ourselves into jobs of higher demand which involve AI and the like. So let's say I'm a book writer. Literature is my field. And now an AI comes into the picture and writes books. In other words, the AI comes to quote and unquote, take my job. According to what you said, I'm supposed to force myself into a job which is AI related, rendering my writing skills useless. My talent is now useless. How is this? A All right. Um, let's, let's get the next person to course of time. I wanted to rebut what you, you wanted to then do it in a few seconds. Okay, so when it comes to writing, AI in itself, for example, using ChatGPT, you have to give ChatGPT prompts to write something for you, right? Depending on the prompts that you give ChatGPT, it will produce something for you. So you need to have the skills and the mind to be able to write so that ChatGPT can produce something of substance for you. So if it is not of stuff, substance. So let's take that as a bad example. The principle behind the question is that AI would render specific jobs redundant. How do you respond to that? In that I don't think it would re render specific jobs redundant, 
but it would it would revolutionize those jobs right so those jobs would evolve to include some aspects of ai not that it would take away the jobs You're right um, the fact that penicillin was invented did not take away the jobs of medical doctors who were using bloodletting at the time but it gave them another avenue to express or to um, effectively do their jobs but then the point that means that it still speaks to the point that they need to evolve but the AI revolution is happening more quickly than there is space for people to reorient themselves and evolve. You are asking somebody who has had education within a specific field, has had 20 years of experience, to have a limited time to adapt or diminish. How, how is that particularly? One thing, change is a constant in life. You cannot be a human being existing in this world and say you do not want to change. So as you see that the trends are changing, you also have to do your best to change with it. If you want to remain how you are, you will die how you are. All right, that's, that's a very fair response. So um, let's take the next person quickly. I'm a champ of Rexford no from Edu Genfi Senior High School, an elective ICT student. I was glad when a question was asked to the, to the second speaker and then she said, it's better, it would be better if you did research. AI holds a pool of researches, and then it gives answers. And then one, one from the negative side too said, we think the AI is smarter. AI is never smarter, because it holds theories, which has been approved already. And then we all, as students, science students, we are all using theories, which has been approved already. And then the AI is holding them already, so we are using them. All right, thank you. Last person. Okay. Hello, everyone. Well, last My name is James Diagesi from Medi Genfi Senior High School. Um, to start with, our lady who was speaking for the motion said that AI cannot take the jobs of human beings. And what I want to say is that at first, human beings were making cars. But now we see that robots, majority of the works are done by robots. And what I want to say is that there may be a time that um, the jobs of medical doctors and some engineering sectors may be done by robots and not human beings. But the truth is that these robots at that time can be very efficient. Was it so much about humans that we need to force them to do things that they cannot be best at? The question again. So you say that with time, certain jobs will be taken by AI, okay? And but the point is that that is because AIs do those jobs better, right? The argument you got from here is that those people have the time to adapt and reorient themselves in something else. Do you get it? So the, the issue is this. Why are you saying that we shouldn't adopt AI just because people will lose their jobs when we know that AIs can do those jobs better? Okay, this is that there will be difficulty in people and then they are living. So those, okay, that's fair, fair response. Um, we have the last person here. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I am Clinton Nanedia, a student of Kumar Senior High Technical School. Okay, so what I am much concerned about is national security. As, as long as AI is concerned, so among the eight elements of national security, that is demographic security, um, military security, border security, health security, economic security, and the rest. I am much concerned about health security and economic security since they've talked much about AI being a reductionist in, term, in our education system. So when it comes to our economic security, I think that embracing AI can bring about economic advancement in the sense that AI can help business organizations to make predictions in the business sector and also help to you to make um, analyze your next digital plans and then um, in 2018 the nature conservancy is partnering with microsoft and using ai to map ocean world so there are a whole sort of circumstances whereby people are using ai in the economic field and then when we come to the health aspect to for example is the robotic wheelchair it allows future users, um, disabled, to use their facial expression to control. And then they pointed out that AI um, destroyed the connection between able people and then disabled people. But then that is, that is what I am against because AI helps. Okay, we will, we will agree to the fact that it disconnects, um, it, con 
It destroyed All the right, connection so between. I think the, the point is fair made. First, on the back of the fact that AI is very efficient and leads to increased productivity, it says that overall that will lead to economic prosperity for the world. And then secondly, with respect to persons with disability, you had an argument that says that there is limited social interaction. He says there are specific AI-based interventions that help them do things better and even aid their survival and livelihood. That's a very brilliant subject. Let's take the last person here. Thank you very much. My name is Emmanuel Kweta Itiatiapa, um, second year civil engineering student. So two things I'd like to talk about. I'd like to begin with the saying. There's a saying that tough time creates strong men, strong men create easy times, and easy times create weak men. What that seeks to prove is that if you are to move in the direction of AI being a blessing, what, what, it, see, what it will do is that the kind of people that we are going to um, train, they're, they're like the human beings, they are going to um, in, be in a world that, which is quite easy. The culture would then become a culture of like lazy, lazy people. They're not working hard enough. That feeds into the argument of the research. So they will opt into things like charge BTP, um, research bots that exist, and they're not taking the hard time and effort to be able to do the research that is required for them to be able to evolve. When you look around, you have more SHS students than the university students that are actually supposed to come and listen to this because you have like easy times where they can use a lot of things to do their research. The first pushback is that we are going to create a world where people will become like very lazy. We don't want such a world. The second thing is on the regulation and the ethical aspect of the AI. As um, Professor Mnobo said during Tazi, she said, computer scientists in MIT, like, the AI is even evolving faster than them, like, than their own knowledge. So the AI is able to even evolve faster than what they are able to predict. We think the unpredictability of the AI is something that we do not want, because one, you can't control it, it's very unstable, you want a world, even if change is a constant, you should be able to limit change to some extent. AI is a case because you'll not be able to control it within the higher education spectrum. All right, and that's interesting. But you'd have to respond to this. The goal is to get the job done. Given that AI gets the job done, what is there to get in doing the job or getting the job done the hard way? Because um, what AIs provide is the opportunity to get the work done easily and more efficiently and probably save time for happy experiences and collaboration and all that, social interaction. Yeah, I think those things can be got, are gotten in a large social interaction on all those things. You can get them at church parties, a lot of places. I think what you need to say is like the experience that is needed. Because well, the, the, point is, yes. the point is, you say people become lazy yeah. because they wouldn't use the hard way. Yeah. But the goal is to get the job done. Yeah. AI assures you of a high level of efficiency to get the job done. Yes. What is there in getting the job done through the hard way for which we shouldn't use AI if we know that AI gets it done more effectively? For the next generation of leaders and as posited by the motion in higher education, we need people with a certain level of experience to be able to handle like the evolving, like AI is an evolving, like fourth generation evolving technology. If AI can even get the job done, we need people with like the experience. So our leaders or the lecturers that will be lecturing us, we need them to have the practical hands-on experience so that they'll be able to impact the knowledge for us. If AI is to get the job done for them very easily, we think they are less likely to want to put in the effort and experience to be able to evolve and impact the knowledge that they continually impact to us. That's, that's great, that's great. So we're done with everybody here, right? Or someone has not spoken there? You've not. We have the last person here. So quickly, then let's, let's continue the debate. All right. Hello. All right. Um, I'm Matthew Japon. I'm a first year land economy student and also a debater. Right. So first of all, I'll engage the issue that Itiapa brought to us. Right. He says that tough times create tough men. Easy times create easy men. And so he says that, oh, tough times create tough men. Easy times create like weak men, right? And so because of that, let's make the training tough so that when they get into the field, they will be tough enough to face everything that is necessarily they, they are supposed to. 
But the thing to notice about that is that as times change, the level of dexterity or toughness needed to survive in a particular field also changes with different levels of technology. What this means is that in as much as 20, 30, let's say 500 years ago, it was important for a construction worker to be able to lift boulders at the back, right? To be able to be strong enough to do all that. He doesn't need to do that as time goes on because articulator tracks and all these things that can carry these rocks necessarily have developed. At the end of the day, what you see is that you don't need to be so tough in order to survive in, on, on market right now. At the point where these technologies exist to make things easier for them, you need to be able to learn how to use these technologies because that is the only way you survive on the market. That is the first thing to note. Right. Yeah, that is the first thing to note, right? So, the thing, entirely, what we hear from them, oh, it's going to make people lazy. I think the same thing was said about the calculator. But I don't need to learn logarithmic equations in my head, right? Or to find cosine of complex numbers. Because calculators do exist. We tell you that it does not degrade your integrity or your ability to work. It simply complements your work. And it's that complement that makes up for human society. Panel. There is a void. With a growing population and with growing competition, we need to be able to fill that void and make sure human beings are able to survive. The only way to fill this void is to adapt or to take into consideration technologies that make our work easy. That is the only way by which you can necessarily survive as a society, and that's the way the voids are filled. Thank you very All much. Right. So, in short, he says, the hard way that you talk about is overrated. AI can get the job done. Get it done. There's no need for that. Last submission, and then we're done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my name is Salim Salisu. I'm a second-year industrial engineering student. So I think most of the examples is not necessarily fair because I don't think calculators and the rest of you can be analogous to AI because AI inherently is the idea of creating an a, a sentient device that can necessarily think on its own and act on its own. That makes it very distinct from existing technologies like camera, web, and the rest of you. But then my concerns about the regulatory aspect, which was raised by the principal speaker, Koju, that this AI gave a structural reason why we can't regulate it. So there's, there's, like currently even existing, there's not any regulatory framework that necessarily exists. I haven't heard anything from the affirmative aspect as to how we can necessarily regulate it. Because I think that in status quo, the reason why we allow most of the things to exist is a fact that we can be able to regulate them to some extent. So insofar as they've proven to us that these machine learning devices are almost impossible to regulate, what that means is that the trends that necessarily posed to us not, are not just unpredictable, but oftentimes cannot be controlled. So we think that oftentimes there's a principle in today's argumentation that hasn't been engaged by the affirmative aspect. They have to give us a principle reason why, insofar as it's too sentient, it should be acceptable by society, and in fact, most importantly, in an academic space, as we are talking about in today's debate. So that's my most important concession, the ethical concern and the regulatory framework that doesn't exist in status quo. All right, thank you very much for that. I think for the purpose of time. So we thank our audience for that beautiful engagement. So I'm sure that you have more questions to ask and you get further insight as the debate progresses. At the last and final stage of the debate, we give you the chance to ask specific questions to the teams and they'll respond to you. So we will get back to the debate that is happening. All right, so we will invite the next speaker on the affirmative to begin the next half of the debate. All right. First of all, I'd like to give thanks to God and before I begin my speech. So, starting now, the chairperson, the VC, the chancellor of MIT, permits me to stand on the already existing protocols. So, according to a researcher at MIT Initiative, on digital economy, Georgios Petropoulos says that the interaction between humans and AI will become more prevalent as we move forward. What this means is that irrespective of the kind of change that exists within higher education, 
after you are done with your education, you will still have to interact with AI. So at what point are you able to learn or equip yourself to be able to adapt in this increasingly environment? We think that it is more a blessing when we have AI in our higher education because that is the only field that we are able to have these particular skills and these particular learning opportunities. What this means is that we need to prepare ourselves for the future work because individuals and organizations then would prioritize upscaling and rescaling to ensure that people have the skills and necessary knowledge to thrive in an AI-driven world. What this means is that the strategic position of higher education makes it important to advance this particular cause. Team Negative would give you a lot of statistics, but the issue here is that if people do not want change and do not want to adapt, when they go outside these higher educational institutions, they suffer. That is why we say, go through the pain, evolve, adapt. If you want to be a book writer and AI is taking your job, do something else. You can become an entrepreneur. AI can take that particular skill away from you. We think that is something that is very important in that regard. Because the educational system exists to socialize students to fit into the ever-evolving world. This means that the evolution of artificial intelligence is inevitable and nothing can be done to stop it. The question is, how do we humans, that is students, lecturers, researchers, adapt and fit into this particular system? That will lead me to engage the first speaker on the side of negative. When he says that when it comes to education, there is a need for interaction. One thing we all need to understand is that when it comes to interaction, we have two basic forms. One, online interaction, and secondly, in-person interaction. We believe that higher education should prioritize holistic interaction and feed not into the rhetoric that you should only come to school to learn and only to be academically inclined. This is to tell the various um, SHS students here is that when you come to KNUST, don't only focus on your academic focus on extracurricular activities. That is why in KNUSD, we have the KNUSD Debate Society, you have ENACTUS, you have the United Nations Student Association. All those are avenues where you can interact and be, be able to become the holistic person. So even in class, if you are relying on AI, with debate and other interaction, you would become the critically inclined person that these guys Point. do not want you to do. But then how does AI enhance in-person interaction? Interaction, which is one of the biggest problem from my friends over there. One thing we need to understand is that prompts, which is AI dependent, depends on information that it is fed, which means that any information or response is subjected to discourse and interrogation. One thing we need to understand coming to higher educational platform is that any information or no data or no knowledge is specific or no knowledge is stagnant. What this, what this means is that any information can be rebutted. Any information can be intellectually um, competed against. What this, what this means is that you are not obliged to accept whatever that your lecturer tells you, you to you? do. You can academically challenge those particular knowledge that your lecturer gives you. That is the opportunity higher education gives you. What this means is that any information that can come from artificial intelligence within the higher educational setting, we are able to challenge those particular information. That is why you need not to accept what they tell you. That when we use AI, we become dependent on them. In a way, we become stupid and we are not able to think for ourselves. One thing you need to understand is that the information or the knowledge you get from AI-generated prompts, as an individual, you can question them and you are not supposed to accept them verbatim in that particular Point. regard. But one thing we also need to understand is the evolution of society before that year. Dependence on AI is you admitting that you are smarter than me, me if really we were intelligent, if really we as intelligent as AI is, why would we need to depend on it? Engage it as it is. Humans are less efficient. All right. So this moves me to my next point on evolution of society. So 
a profound sociologist, that is Emil Deckham, believes that society evolves through a process of differentiation and specialization. Why is this very important? At a point where society evolves, there is a, a, a field that says that there's supposed to be division of labor. Why this is very important is because at every point in time, we would want to focus on minute things to ensure that we get the efficiency out of that particular point. What this means is that the world then becomes interconnected and complex. What this means is that we need to interdepend on one another. The reason why this is very important is because we then get to interdepend, so we depend on AI. AI necessarily also depends on us for information and data to be able to feed you with those particular information. We think that even those particular dependence is a structure of society and no man is an island. We depend on one another to ensure that we get to where we want to be. But then moving on, the blessing touch of AI is that one, AI helps us with data collection. And I think this has been engaged entirely in this debate. The reason why this is important is because this AI forces students to be imaginative of a new world and not restrict ourselves to the confirmation bias of holding on to hold habits and professions that won't hold any value. When you know that AI is taking up jobs in the, in the industrial system, one thing that as students we need to pride ourselves in is that we need to evolve and to be able to adapt and learn these particular skills. If you decide to stay where you are, you are. depend on jobs that are already being taken by AI, you become jobless and you are going to suffer. This is the opportunity. Higher education provides us that particular opportunity to explore and rethink about our decision. But why does higher education help? One, on research and the focus on ethical consideration. What this means is that we are able to bring up newer perspective and information around this new technology that we are, we are studying. One thing we need to understand on AI and the jobs is that, as Dennis Atisu says, it is all about collaboration and not competition. Artificial intelligence usually is a software code and AI cannot necessarily do some of these things because one, it hasn't really graduated to the point where it can take up the jobs of certain jobs like being a surgeon, being a NASA um, um, astronaut, etc. We think that even if this particular argumentation from the negative side is true, one thing we need to understand is that there is an opportunity for us to evolve. We need to engage other skills. You can be an entrepreneur. You can do other things to ensure that you, you can are. be the best person that the world needs. Solve the smallest problems within your locality, and at the end, you'll be a great person. Proud to be on Affirmative. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Lord Opong, for that speech. would invite the next speaker on the negative side. Okay, I'm very happy to be here. I thank God and I also thank the KNUSC Debate Society who took me from my first year of timidity and made me very outspoken. And I've been able to occupy leadership roles in the school. I owe my appreciation to the KNUST Debate Society. OK, so I'm going to start my speech now. Artificial intelligence and emerging technologies have permeated every aspect of our lives, promising a future of convenience, efficiency, and limitless opportunities, as already established by the side from Affirmative. Yet, as we delve deeper into this realm of innovation, it becomes increasingly apparent that behind this facade lies a case specifically to higher education waiting to be unleashed, and believe you me, humanity can stand it. Important clarity in today's debate. This debate is not about industries. It is about higher education and its pursuits. So for instance, should we teach our university students on how to manipulate algorithms to operate on like humans, 
or we should, like, we should teach them to rely on their intellect as a result of what they have been taught. That should be the scope of the debate. We can't have debates about industries when the motion is specific to higher education. My job here is to give key responses to side affirmative and also to defend our stance as side negative. So the biggest thing you get from their side is how they say you take away some jobs, yet you provide for some. First response is on how th there's actually a lot of automation of jobs which has actually reduced human labor. What they had to do was to defend why a shrink in, an in like unemployment is very good, like considering the fact that the world has gotten to a tipping point where like employment is a very difficult thing to get. It means in a world where you take away people's job, they were supposed to defend why that kind of idea is good. We never got that from their side. They can't win over at, on, that, on that clash, right? But then again, we spoke about like uncertainty in future job landscapes on how there's actually like rapid advancement in AI and emerging technologies, which is very like challenging for individuals to, I mean, predict which individuals, like which industries and job roles, which will be most affected by AI. We think that at a point where there's actually this level of uncertainty and like, I mean, indecisiveness it means choosing career paths becomes very difficult because for all you know, like in, in this era, it could be a job, like a very lucrative job, but then in the next five to 10 years, it could be automated and you have nothing to do, right? But what we get from Sir Lord about the idea of entrepreneurs, and I think that is very problematic and it's very risky if we, if we tend to buy into the argument, is that one, realize that not everyone can be an entrepreneur. What he had to do was to prove that the shift like, into all of a sudden people channeling their energies or their dreams into becoming entrepreneurs is going to be achieved because there are lots of people seated here who are head bent on becoming specific, like becoming specific job prospects. So there are pe people here who really want to be writers, who want to be communicators, who want to be lawyers. It's not like your idea of entrepreneurs that's actually going to change them. But then again, since AI service is very expensive, it means that it is true that we are not going to employ a lot of people because we cannot necessarily pay them and all those things. But then again, AI keeps growing. I think it's one thing that we've been hammering from our side, right? AI keeps growing. It means that they ha also have to defend that humans can evolve at the pace at which AI is also growing. But then again, like even faster than this AI, we do not get anything about that from side affirmative. But one important thing about entrepreneurship and how it can affect the world is this. One, it means that credit systems are going to be choked. Why is this true? Because not everyone has the capital to start like a job or become an entrepreneur. It means more people applying for loans and all those things. That is very problematic for, I mean, states, developing countries who cannot necessarily self-sustain. But then two, how do we get convenience? Because it looks like Consume like we, Belinda. human beings form like consumers. Fifth minutes, human beings like form the consumers. Consumers. It means that if you posit that we all should be entrepreneurs or we all should channel our energies into, I mean, job opportunities that that don't necessarily rely on AI to operate, then it means that you do not get that benefit in your in your world. But then engaging a, a big clash. Um, I mean, when the 15 minutes engagement was ongoing, this is it on the idea of being a writer. So you are a writer, you input your prompt into chat GPT, you get your script done. This is like where we draw the difference. As a client who I'm supposed to purchase the services of a writer, I equally can also input my prompt into this chat GPT and I get the job done. It means I, I save my money and I even save my time as to how I'm supposed to contact a writer or an editor to review my work or write it for me. That's how our world is being affected. We do not get paid. Everyone all of a sudden becomes master of all trades. Say, Lord, your POI. Your side ran away from the case that the emergence of AI is all about um, collaboration and not competition. So you can't just take spurt of um, entrepreneurship. There are other professions that AI will just collaborate with the human um, perspective to ensure that they get the job done in that regard. Engage. Okay, so if you were listening to me clearly, I said AI is evolving at a very fast pace. So a job that is very lucrative now 
would be overtaken by automated machines in the next five to ten years. That's a very response, like a very quick response to your case, right? But on their argument about education 4.0 and why that is very problematic, I think my side has already engaged how we tend to like question the intent as to whether this individual truly merits the work that has been um, disposed. But then again, it affects how students think critically. So you have zero to less incentive to build upon your intellect. Why? Because AI is available to do, do all, the, all the thinking. You only have to input the prompts and get the job done. We think that that stillness in intellect of students is one that is very problematic to education. And that is what we are against. But then again, it's also important to also note that the educational needs of students are not solely defined by performance or specific data points. There's more to it. So factors like motivation, factors like creativity, factors like critical thinking skills are difficult to like, quantify and incorporate into AI-driven personalized systems because they have zero emotions. And this is important because in the context of higher education, we have diverse backgrounds, culturally, socially, etc. AI-based systems may struggle to account for these like, um, contextual factors, hence it is important to make people get the ability to think on their feet. Also, the biggest contention we had in today's debate is the idea of socialization. At best, they say, oh, we have peer reviews, we have interactions and whatnot. Realize that all these things are fine. But the question becomes, how is it conducted? So as peers, when you meet, do you meet to input prompts into chat GPT to get answers to your work? Or you meet to brainstorm and get the assignment done? That is the problem you are trying to solve from side negative. The world of affirmative preaches over reliance, which trickles down to a diminished sense of human interaction within education settings. But why is academic socialization even important? One, because we think that things like effective listening like active brainstorming and negotiations as I've established already are skills that are vital for professional and personal settings so long as career prospects are important. Affirmative says, oh, they have AI, yet they socialize. All those things are fine, but then when it comes to the context of higher education, that kind of uh, academic socialization is lost. The reduction in the socialization is what we are against from side negative. The traditional roles of educators and academic institutions find themselves grappling with the fear of obsolescence. The future of AI in emerging technologies rests in our hands. The human connection, intellectual discourse, critical thinking, natured in classrooms face the risk of being replaced by impersonal algorithms and prepackaged content. But I think that the recognition of this case can serve as a catalyst for transformative action. Higher education must harness AI and emerging technologies as a tool for enhancing rather than replacement and all the things that we spoke about. Only through our conscious and responsible actions can we navigate this treacherous path ahead and transform a case into a catalyst for progress and well-being. Proud to be negative. Thank you very much, Belinda, for that speech. So, we would hear from the final speaker from the negative, in the person of Master Kelvin Damte. Maybe you get to know why he's national champion, or maybe not today. Um, I'm actually a man of tech, which is why I have my computer here. I'll surely show that I know better. I'd like to dedicate this speech to my family. Um, my brother is here, my father is here, and it shows that community building is far more important than having ideas. I begin now. NetDragon Websoft, a gaming service in Hong Kong, appointed its latest CEO. As someone who wants to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I try to look him up and see what Tang Yu has been able to achieve in the corporate ladder. Unfortunately, Tang Yu is a robot. The CEO of ChatGPT's OpenAI is not known by anybody. Why? Because it is a robot. What it means specifically is that they needed to show what specifically would be the skills that we would have and what we would compete with AI against. I agree with them. 
you cannot compete with AI. It is not competition, surely, because AI, that's a human oriented. They say that we would need AI to replace the reorientation of students and faculty members. I wonder what would become of our faculty when AI finally takes over. Dear parents, it is okay to be afraid of what will become of your words. My father has always prided himself in how achieved I am as a computer science student. Little does he know that AI can code, AI can develop websites, AI can build AI. What it means specifically is all the things that they claim that AI will not do, it's already doing it. My brother is here, he's a photographer. He never started as a photographer. He was into building of art and craft until unfortunately 3D printing PI. by AI came. He decided to do photography. Guess what? Drone photography is existing now and AI motion detection is able to take better pictures than my brother. They say you have to keep evolving. For how long will you evolve? For how long will you spend money pursuing skills that will be taken away by a system when we could simply declare it as something that is inconclusively not a benefit to us? Team Affirmative has said you should learn a skill. Skills are expensive. If they weren't, we would have all had them. They do not prove in any way how skills are working on the ground that anyone can just pick them up. My high school students, it's very important that this debate is not just about the wonders of technology. As someone who has experienced technology and what it can do myself, I say that it is beneficial for us to be engaging in the learning process and yeah. engage in it fully. I'll take a point if there's any. So you have all indicated from side negative how this is supposed to be in the context of a higher education. All the examples that you have given is something that will still go on in the industrial world and it's not stopping just because you are talking about it. How then are we equipping the higher education students to actually adapt better in that world? Um, I think that is why we win the debate. Do you know why? Because industry will do it anyway. If you don't do it, someone will do it. What they should prove to us is why we should be doing it while other people are also doing it. In countries that have low technological department and de development, I wonder how a doctor who was AI trained would be able to operate on a pregnant woman in Lejekuku when the AI model cannot get internet connectivity. These are very deep-rooted problems, and what it means is we need the raw skills. We cannot do away with them. Most importantly, Chancellor Professor Melissa Nobles and all stakeholders outside the KNUST community, I would like to, at this point, draw your distinguished attention to our motto, Nyan Sapo Wasanino Badrima. An antibiotic resistant bacteria was defeated by AI. If that is not bringing something new, that scientists have wondered 1100 years about, I don't know what new thing they are talking about. Dear audience, I may not know a lot, but I at least know that the motto of MIT resonates with the motto of KNUST. Mens and manute in Latin, in English, mind and hand. Our focus should not be just to train the next set of leaders who would use their hands and minds to depend on an AI, and instead of trying to innovate, would be waiting for the next version of ChatGPT and Google Bard to escape detection by Tenetin's AI. We are all students. We know how it's important that students do not have too much free time. The university environment is very important, and we cannot let our communities die away just because there's an easier way to do things. Today, you may accuse those who are le le losing their jobs as people who lack innovation, as people who are old-fashioned, but these are parents of people. They need to feed their children. These are students who are struggling to pay their fees. They need to work. AI can do better secretarial job than a vice chancellor's secretary. She still has a secretary because she knows that people need to survive. People need jobs in this economy. When you give them a system that would allow those people to be replaced, you displace a huge amount of the population. 
what is the vice chancellor secretary going to do to start another degree? She will need money. But newsflash, she has lost her job. What it means specifically is that they need that empowerment to gain those new skills. I would like to say that if we are skeptics, so be it. People who cannot give you a specific game plan, they keep talking about innovating. Jesus is the only one who in a flash could turn water into wine. It will take you years to build a skill because whatever skill you want to build, people have already been building it. They should show us in their last speech what specific skills will not be taken away. I would like to end with this, that I would rather fall for the illusion that there is a better university than KNUST in Ghana than believe that AI and emerging tech is a blessing to higher education. Thank you. All right, so that's a speech for national debate, from national debate champion. And I'm sure you know why he is. All right, so to end the debate for the negative side, also a World Universities Debate semi-finalist in the person of Master Dovlo. Looks like Dovro is too angry. <laughs> <laughs> Kindly relax or rest. <laughs> Since this is the last speech of the ceremony, it's only prudent that my introduction resplendently suits the persona of our guests. The special invited guest, Professor Melissa Nobles, the Chancellor of MIT. It's worth noting that in Professor Melissa Nobles University, a billion dollars has been invested into the Stephen A. Schwarzman College to targeted at deepening research in AI. My Vice Chancellor, Professor Rita Kosha Dixon, under whose leadership, KNUS has a million dollar grant into researching in AI under the responsible AI labs. Panel, it's a very good scenery to have two visionary professors who resonate with me in the very profound belief that innovation is a great way that the university can shake the world today. Charles Darwin once said, and it's often misquoted, and this is the true version of the speech, it is not the most intellectual of the species that survive. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, but it's the species that is the one who is most adaptable to change and adjust to a changing environment in which it finds itself. AI may be artificial, but its impacts are tangible and realistic. What we get from opposition is an unbridled romanticization of unnecessary hassle and suffering culture. Panel, at the introduction of my speech, I ask you to ask them a question. Panel, to what ends would we sacrifice an advancement in productivity, efficiency in research, and permit my phantasmagorical outlook, an exchange in which we can find the cure for cancer just to maintain an age-old and stagnant culture of education where we have nothing that is the helper? According to the International Baccalaureate for Research and Education, it will take 50 to 70 years for robots to completely take over 10% of the jobs that exist today. There's a factual inaccuracy in the last speech that he gave. Point. The CEO of OpenAI is Sam Altman and not a robot. Currently, the only things that the robots can take over are industry jobs that are extremely based online. What does that mean? Build a building to the roofing level and call Chad GPT to come and complete that building for you. I can assure you deeply, Chad GPT can never do that. <laughs> nursing people in the world today can never be taken completely over of nursing. Taking care of homes, ETC, are things that are left to emotional efficient beings like human beings. If you like, take your dress, Chad GPT, and let Chad GPT sue the rest of the dress for you. There are jobs that are going to be left. Point. They cannot come and fear monger you into believing that AI is the bane of existence. Panel, jobs are very important because for you to be a person of meaning, you need to solve a problem. 
What do we tell you in today's debate? Truly, without jobs, a human being cannot be anything. Panel, AI is a complementary tool, and the only thing it does is that it aids people to get the things that they have. That is why the teaching assistant came to tell us about how it's a complementary thing. But let us wipe the slate clean. Let us accept that according to the Bloomberg Business Report in 2018, it will take 50 to 70 years, and one day we'll see 11% of the jobs becoming extremely automated. Why do we still have a lifeline? Two things, whenever there's a life-changing evolution that is happening. One, policy. Two, evolution. There was a time in China where they had an overpopulation problem. What the Chinese government did is that it had a policy that told the people you can only give birth to one person at a time. What that did is that they had policies that regulated evolutions and things that were happening. There's nothing to say that the government of Ghana, the government of USA, cannot regulate as to how AI goes. That's why the proponents of AI, like Elon Musk, introduced things like the universal basic income, which is to say that because AI takes over your work, we cannot pay people an equitable amount of money that they can all get. That's why the MIT Chancellor is nodding to what I am saying, because all of you know this. Let us continue the panel in issue of policy direction and evolution. There has been four stages of human advancement. There was the metal age, there was the age of the industrial revolution. Human beings lost their jobs at all these pivotal times, but there's no world in which there is no job today. What is that to say? In places like KNUST, you do not only come here to learn only economics. You learn things like sociology, you learn things like psychology, you learn things like skills. To ICT, you have five different multifaceted skills that even if today your job goes down, you have four other areas. But Point. Mano, I ask you a question. If today, in the next 50 to 70 years, realistically, jobs can be taken over, and there's a human being who within 50 to 70 years cannot adapt to the new world, do we blame AI or do we blame that person for not being able to see the future and things are being presented and take on that? We cannot allow fear mongering to tell us what to do and what not to do. Point. Before I continue our point. Unfortunately, touch GPT is not the only AI that exists in the world. I don't think the goal of the investment that the VCs are making would be to have an inefficient AI system. You need to engage with the debate and not run away from the core issues, which is that people you know, want to go into business. Too. They want to go into tech. Thank you. Thank you for entering the trap that I said. Why do certain jobs get taken over? Panel, this debate may look like light-hearted, but it's a very serious event. In the event where your dear parents has cancer or your dear parents has a terminal disease, let me ask you. Would you want someone or a machine that would operate to a near zero margin of failure when it's a life and death situation? Or would you allow a human being that whose ability to even operate on that person has a larger margin of failure where that person may die? The only reason that certain jobs get taken over is that A, those jobs can be better performed and are much more efficient than when human beings do them. Or B, those jobs DOI, are please. extremely dangerous. Like deep sea mining, things like human beings carrying boulders on their backs to build buildings. What that is to say that certain jobs that get taken over is for the best. What is that to say? We are a world where scientists using these AIs cannot have something that addresses them to work on things such as changing the cosmos. As Greta Thunberg and the rest of the climate activists tell you, if you are not able to salvage the world we are in now, in the next 50 years, the human civilization can be something of the past. What we demand is a light speed and something that has precision that can help us to change the world, advance the human race, and protect ourselves as a people. The job issue has been thrown away. Let us move on to socialization. Panel, Aristotle once said that human being is a social animal, and we echo his words in today's debate. Last point. What do we say on a human being being a social animal? It is to say that people have the ability to engage with each other, to choose whether they want to socialize with you or not. There's a Point. fundamental intellectual flaw in the speech they make. In their speech, they equate in-person learning to socialization. Every single individual with me in the university today can agree that every new Point. semester that we go to class, we see a new class. That is to say, just because we sit in the same class does not mean we'll know each other. That is why we have other basic means Point. of people socializing, like going to games together, like going to peer-to-peer -to -peer researches. Let me ask everyone sitting here, because of AI, does it mean that group works would end? Would does it mean that peer-to-peer -peer research would end? Does it mean you can no longer go to church to socialize with each other? Does it mean you can no longer go to the mosque to associate with everybody? That means 
Canada's socialization does not come to an end. And it is quite sarcastic for a site that uses Khan Academy, YouTube, to learn at their own space. Kelvin Damte was in my room the former time listening to a, something that was taught on Khan Academy and comes here to tell you people to not learn at a faster space. But no, we need things that will help people to operate faster, to operate more efficiently. What that is to say, socialization is important. Putting people in an in-person class does not mean they will socialize. We do not have all the answers. But what we can say is that organically, because of things such as going to church together, things such as peer-to-peer -peer things, things such as group work, people will be able to do all those things. Socialization is deeply assured on our side. Let's get to the last but not the least thing, which is to talk about human beings getting damper and our cognitive ability going lower. Side negative is like the people in Texas in 1957 when there was the advent of the modern calculator. People in Texas said, one, this will make people dumb. Two, this is the sign of the end times. People are going to die. This is what the Bible said, that calculators will take over our brain. It is actually very, very sarcastic that today the Bloomberg Business Report announces that human beings are 250% much more advanced than 50 years ago. Today, we have faster food processing. Today, we have people that are more literate and numerate than the people of 1957 Texas. We have people that are much more curious to learn what, to learn what research is, to learn how to better how human experience in this life looks like. What that is to say is that when we have stumbling blocks to research and higher education, for example, I want to research on something, but I cannot get the references fast. I want to research on something, and I cannot paraphrase that enough, because let it be noted that universities understand that we can only stand on the shoulder of people that have gone past us to learn. Knowledge is not a solitary thing, it's a communal thing. That is why in every university, there's a percentage of paraphrasing, of copying someone's work that you can do. It's when you do not add anything to that. That is why we have state-of-the-art things, like writerly AI, like turn it in, that can actually get to know when these works are being researched or not. You may not agree that these things, you may agree that these things are not perfect and they cannot grab everybody, but what we know is that AI is a self-learning and a self-evolving thing, which is to say, the deeper that people go in paraphrasing and escaping this thing, the deeper there are more AIs that can actually catch and grab these people. The rational choice theory states that because people do not want to lose the things that they have and are ashamed to be embarrassed, they would want to add much more things. That is why in places like KNUST, research and education is more practical. You need to defend your thesis these days. You need to have peer-to-peer -peer research these days. You need to make sure that you can defend your work in the sight of external and internal vigilators. If you just go and paraphrase the entire internet, you will not even right. graduate and your entire paraphrase team goes to hell. Panel. At the end, the invited guests, at the end of today's debate, what is a case? Because no one has told you what a case is. They only told you how you don't have blessings. A case is a, in a world where there are lots of pandemics killing millions of people, and we do not have the speed and technology to solve that and to bring a cure to all these things at a very fast rate. All right, Hello, thank a you. case is a world where technology and population is not being matched by advanced technology. A, a case is a world where there are SHS students sitting over here but cannot vote because they do not have phones. Even if there was AI here, I'm very sure that everyone here would be able to vote, but now you need to raise your hands because opposition tells you that AI is the devil that's supposed to take you down. But now, at the end of today's debate, AI brings a ladder that will Thank take you. education time is to up. higher heights. Your time is up. We ask you to be part of the adaptable species that goes with us to evolve and change in a world where the world becomes better, we can solve diseases faster, research can be at a light fasting speed, and as human beings, we can get Thank the you. entire total Thank human you. experience Thank at the you. end of the day. Proud to be here. So, um, there was a next session to this, but because of time, we really cut that short. We will get one representative from each side to respond to specific questions. I will just to take two questions for each side, and then we end the debate. So, Team Positive, who is representing? The speaker should just come quickly. So the audience have the opportunity to ask specific questions to these speakers, and they will respond to you. Let's do that very snappy, and then we will take the second vote 
from everybody. And then we see whether there's a difference between the initial vote and then the final vote. All right. Quick, if you have a question, kindly come up. Please come forward. I want just two people here, two people there. Just four. And your question should be very direct. Okay, it's fine. Oh. Let's do it very, very quickly. You want to ask the questions to the affirmative or the negative? To them. And then you also want to ask them those questions. So let's take the first question from you. Hello, everyone. So from what they were saying, they were saying that... Can you speak into the mic, probably? Okay, so my question is, for every technology that has actually benefited man mankind's academics, there has been a form of regulation to what point it is needed and to what point it is not. But for AI as an emerging technology, there is no such framework. So what does, it, what does this mean? It means that there's a tendency for it to take over the space. And at the point where AI has fully developed and has a will of its own, show us how at we that point it, was still, it will still be able to benefit us in the long run. Thank you. All right, go ahead and answer it. Um, thank you very much. Um, so the talk about AI being regulated, just like every innovation and everything that seeks to shape how we see the world and we imagine, we imagine the human experience, governments have a duty to control these things. That is why in certain states in the European Union or in Europe, the AIs are not allowed there at all because they believe they breach information and so the producers or the organizations that control these things prove that they do not breach information they are then allowed. But also, people that are the pioneers of AI, people like, um, people like Elon Musk, people like uh, uh, Sam Altman, people like um, the writer of the book, The 21, um, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, these are people that have groups that they come together to agree on how development of AI should go and how they can be done at best. So that gives two places where All right. AI can be regulated. Thank you. Next question. Quick enough. Hello. The question shouldn't be more than 15 seconds. Okay. The response shouldn't exceed 30 seconds. Hello. So in as much as we would want to have an engagement on the very important critical issue here, I would want to pose a question to Master Dovlo. Um, example of how things happen on the factory floor of an automotive workshop where everything that is done from scratch to the time the car leaves that automotive workshop is being done by robots, and then there's a driver that needs to test those particular vehicles. But guess what? The car is self-driven. And there are so many instances where you go to so many um, when washing bays, and human beings are not needed to wash those cars, and it's just robots that are working on them. My question to you is, this is a very critical and a, a very serious issue that we need to analyze. Regardless of whether you want to win the debate, how do you answer the question to these people being laid off, these factory floors, no driver to test them, no people right. to watch them, and all that? That's my question. I think I've spent two minutes talking about that already. But just to reiterate, the evolution of the human race where jobs are being taken over, there are innovative new jobs that people can always work in, that is to say, even in the process of building AIs, the building of the AI, the maintenance of the AI and running AI, it needs human beings to make it work. And human beings are the ones that run repairs. Human beings are the ones that advance AI, which is to say that just because they take over your work doesn't mean you cannot right. get a new work. Sufficiently explained. Next question. OK, so my question is to you, um, Master Kelvin Damte. So what we are um, basically the point of contention from your side is the fact that we do not want to sacrifice the integrity or the academic integrity of our students um, over to AI. What I want to ask you is that in the industry or in industry, 
if AI was going to help us make significant strides in areas such as healthcare, um, um, basically manufacturing, etc., isn't it worth it to sacrifice a few bad eggs or to sacrifice a few people's academic integrity to be able to get the overall benefits which would um, affect more people um, in a good way as compared to the, alter or the alternative or the comparative? The problem is we would not be sacrificing a few bad eggs. We'd be sacrificing hundreds of thousands of students every year because there would be no industry for them to work in. Unlike what the negative says, questions have proved that there are industries that have already been taken. We argue specifically that what students need is an all-rounded experience because you will not always have the access to the best of tech all the time. What you need is the raw skill. That way, tech or no tech, you would be able to excel in your end. Thank you. All right, that's a fair response. Next question. Okay, my question Quick, is... Quick, the question should be very direct. My question is, during researches, like when we practically involve ourselves in researches, we come out with new discoveries from maybe the errors and the mistake you make. If you continue to use AI in these researches, I, I'm not thinking that you get stuck in some aspect of the world. I think there will be no discoveries like new discoveries won't come. Because sometimes during researches, the mistake we make bring out new discoveries, like new things. So won't the use of AI like hurt that aspect of the world? Who are you asking the question to? The affirmative. Okay, Dovlo, take it. So if I understand your question clearly, because AI cannot make mistakes, and because during making mistakes they discover new things, won't we stop having new inventions? I, I do not have the answer to that, but I, can, I do not have the facts to assure that research can be ended or we can no longer innovate. I can only proffer that a world where we are always looking for new things, people would find very innovative ways to bring things. Sometimes we don't know we need them till we have them. All right. Yeah, so you were saying no one explained what a case was, and I wanted to ask you, so what if the AI, over time you've been using it, and then whatever it's being made, there are defects, there are viruses, then you're a surgeon, your mom is on the maternity bed or whatever it's called, and then you have to make the operation or whatever it is, then this virus affects this AI, what are you going to do? I don't think the virus can affect a human being. You get, you get my question. The flu. I think, um, I think the question is. I, I, I. Did, did you get a question? Yeah. So, what if a virus affects the AI? Hello, kindly, Michael, get the question again. Yeah, but I, very I would want direct. To understand the question. Be very direct. Okay, so I was saying, we are just imagining. Your mom is on the sick bed and she has to take this operation. But then you are saying the AI is supposed to do it for you. And you know, this, any technology can be affected by a virus or something. You do not know. <laughs> okay, so the AI has been affected by a virus. And then what it's supposed to do, it will not be able to perform. And this is your mom I'm talking of. The AI just kills your mom just like that. So the question he's asking is similar to what Opana says, a doctor trained to use AI for surgery and goes to Lesokuku where the network goes off. That is the unreliable nature of AI at every particular instance, that idea. So in instances like that where AI cannot come to the occasion because of inherent inefficiencies or contingencies, what do you say about that? Well, um, I think that any company that can be able to make um, very sophisticated AI that can perform a surgery, I'm sure they have enough money to get an antivirus. So I would, I would proffer that they would, they would get an antivirus to probably wipe that virus away and, and hopefully your mom gets the surgery and gets better. All right, fair response. Fair response. Take the last person and then we, we take you, him and then we, we're done. So... My question is that someone, uh, your opponent said that AI can solve um, tsunami problems. 
how can AI solve natural disaster problems? And if that is so, um, go go ahead. So if that is so, how is it that when um, there is an earthquake in Turkey, how did they detect that there is going to be an earthquake so they should all move from that area to a different area? You, he says, in your estimation, you say AI can do a lot of things, including predicting nat natural disasters. His specific question is, how come existing AI could not predict the um, disaster of earthquake in Turkey? That's the question, right? The, 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 uh, the earthquake that killed Christian Achu, to be specific. Yes, why didn't AI detect it? All right, Dovlo, take it. Sure. Um, so to answer your question, I think uh, emerging technologies have brought the ability to measure earthquakes and things like the seismograph, among other things. I would say probably Turkey didn't have the AI that would predict your thing, and that's why they could All right. But, but it is true that they are precision-based um, technological models to predict seismic movement and all that to be able to get earthquakes detected. That is true. All right. So, last person. Thank you. Um, in your presentation, you said um, AI is smarter than us human beings. So, um, God created us. God created man. God created us. So, AI. Um, Please allow. You said, you said AI. <laughs> AI. Um, it works on its own. Is that what you mean? You, you said AI. AI, it works on its own. And it will take um, the job of man right so i want to ask if ai you are saying ai is smarter than us are you trying to say that we we human beings that created ai how can <laughs> how, how can how can what you created be smarter than us and in, in this case, if God, if God created us, how come? I, are you trying to just say that we are smarter than God? Is that what you're trying to say? All right. Um, so I guess you have the question. How can you say that AIs can outsmart humans that created the AI? And by extension, if man's creation can outsmart man, does it suggest that man is smarter than God? <laughs> so, the answer to the question is actually twofold. One, not every human created AI. It means, at best, the humans that could be smarter than AI are the few humans who created it. For better context, OpenAI has less than 2,000 employees. There are 8 billion people in this world. What happens to the 7.9998 million or billion of us who would be left? The second focuses on what it means for a creation to be smarter than its creator. I don't think that you will create something to think just so you will keep thinking. Nobody creates a car to walk. People create systems to think so they don't have to think.
So his response is that just as cars are better at movement than humans that created them, it's possible that AIs can be smarter than humans that created them. That's a good note to end the debate. Thank you very much. All right, so the last thing that is left to be done is to take the last vote. We took a vote before the debate. So you're going to take one now that we are done with the debate. So the link is going to show up. Kindly scan or get to the link and vote and let us know. But for our senior high school colleagues who do not have phones, we will continue to take the head count. In the first round of votes, it was almost unanimous that AI was a blessing. Let's see whether we've been able to reshape those thoughts or not. So as many as you who think that AI is a blessing after this discourse, can we see your hands up? AI is a blessing to higher education. Well, I think you should stand instead. So we see you better. AI is a blessing. All right, kindly sit. If you think AI is a curse. This is interesting. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So let's wait for the vote to happen, and then we will take an interlude from our band, the Ken Resty Cadet Band, in conjunction with the Basie School Band. Kindly give us some short interlude as we take the online votes and conclude the debate. Oh, please wait. We are not done. We are not done, guys. Hello. Please, please don't leave. Um, our teachers from the high schools, kindly, kindly get them in. We are not done with the program. We are taking this interlude to get the votes together.
All right, so the, we have to end the poll. So kindly stop voting. I think some people are still voting. Kindly stop so we can get access to the results to announce. So this is a public debate. So there are no judges. The audience, you are the judges. That's why we took the votes before the debate happened. And before the debate, in the in-house um, audience presence, we had a unanimous endorsement that AI was a blessing. After the debate, we have almost a split decision. That means that the debate has been able to influence your thought processes, has opened your mind to different perspectives, and chances are that you are able to re-evaluate things and understand things differently. For those of you who believe that AI was a blessing at the beginning of the debate, who still believe is a blessing, it means that the debate solidifies your stance and you have a strong conviction. For those of you who switched it means that you might probably have not been seeing all of the perspectives that are available to the subject of AI. But what's even interesting is that we think this debate is a debate that will continue to grow and will continue to evolve even after this gathering. We would implore that you continue to monitor closely and pay attention to the revolution of AI that is happening. Because the truth is that AI has significant implications on all aspects of society and seeks to revolutionize what our human experience is in that consideration. So we will take the final vote, the votes from online session. I think in the in-house in session, we know how it went. We will try to see whether for those who voted online, whether it's consistent with what we have here or there is a difference as well. Kojo, is the vote ready? All right, quickly. So the band should continue the interview for just a minute for us to put the results together and then announce. All right, so as, as we await the results, as we await the results, I think in order not to waste time, we will would, we would take the address from our distinguished guest speaker, who happens to be the chancellor of the MIT USA, in the person of Professor Melissa Nobles, who is the band. This is a round of applause and a standing ovation. A round of applause and a standing ovation. Professor Melissa Nobles. Thank you, everyone. Please sit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my remarks brief. We've had a very full day, but I'll say this. I've learned a lot. Congratulations. I see why you all are national champs. It was terrific. World class. I was, 
I was persuaded by each one of the sides. I was going back and forth like ping pong, trying to decide on which, which one I found more, most persuasive. But at the end of the day, I want to say this. Everything that was raised here is being thought about around the world. Nearly every point that you all made is what every human being in the planet is concerned about. People are scared, on the one hand, about what AI may mean. They're scared about what it will mean for their jobs, which was pointed out, I thought, very effectively by the negative side. People are concerned that you won't think anymore, that you'll be, not only will your jobs be replaced, but you won't have to think, and we will be diminished in our ability to interact with each other as human beings. All of those things are true. It is also true that AI presents enormous opportunities for advancement in knowledge and in medicine and in every imaginable way that the world is not moving. It's very true. The genie is out of the bottle. AI is here to stay. So the challenge becomes, how do we deal with it? And I seem to hear a bit of a consensus, although you all might not have heard it since you were the nature of a debate, of course, is to, is to pick out two different sides. But the truth lies, I think, somewhere in the middle. And it looks like this. There seem to be four basic questions that human societies, including this one, will have to figure out. The first is, how do we think about maintaining human agency, that we don't surrender? We created AI. That's true. Humans created AI. But we have a responsibility now to make sure that we continue to stay engaged with it. And I thought the negative side made a very persuasive argument about that. <laughs> that we ought not have human agency replaced by machines. So we have a debate that we need to continue to have in societies. The second, though, the truth is, that was, as the pro side said, change is inevitable. And change has happened. And change is happening now. And AI, for all of the ways in which it is scary, it is making, for example, disease detection, and the use of data to make sound policy. A lot of governments, including our own in the United States, we need help making policies that are based on data, good data, AI helps with that. So it's not guesswork anymore. There's a lot of problems that the world faces and they're quite complex. AI can help them solve it much more efficiently and much more accurately, sadly, than humans can. The issue, third issue, is regulation and no regulation. Everyone seemed to know that AI is here and I think that the uh, the affirmative side uh, made a, a pretty persuasive argument that we can regulate, a, regulate AI. And I think the negative side wanted to say that regulations have to be stronger. And some of those regulations, if they come from government, relies upon governments who understand AI. I've heard U.S. lawmakers, half of them don't even understand what AI is. So some part of it means making sure that Government people and everyone, adults, understand what AI is and we're going to regulate it. And finally, the end question which came up on both teams was, what will this ultimately mean for human society if, we have, if AI continues in the way that we think that it's going to? What will human life mean? Will it mean that we, can't, we won't have to work anymore? Some people said, if you don't work, you're lazy. If you, and if you don't have effort, you don't learn. Some asked, and that's a question about whether humans need work in order to be human. That's a human question. That's not about, only about economies. It's about how humans organize their lives. How will you spend your day if you don't have to work? Some said they can spend their times with their families. Others thought there may be other things you could do. Maybe the arts would be better. Who knows? But we as humans have to figure out what will it mean not to work since up until this point, most human societies, that's what they do. They work. The second part will be, if you don't have to work, how will you live? Since the, the reason that we work is to earn money. So one uh, suggestion that came up, which is something that's being considered, and I actually, this is what I nodded to when it was mentioned by the affirmative side, governments will have to think about universal basic income. That is, giving people money to stay home. That's a cultural and a economic and a social question that will have to be answered. But let me say this. Human societies are way off from this. We have very basic demands that need to be met in most human societies now. We're talking about AI. Many countries around the world and certainly many regions and nearly every part of the planet don't have electricity. 
So we are a long way from AI being uh, overtaking the human world, but it's certainly true that it is here and we have to take it on board. So I want to congratulate very much this debate. It was terrific. Ghana's in good hands. I heard smart students making persuasive arguments using facts. That's what we need. That's what all human societies need. So I look forward to hearing more about you uh, terrific students in the future and hopefully becoming the leaders of Ghana. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Professor Melissa. All right, so now our vote online is ready. We would invite Professor Edward Apia to do us the honor of taking us through the results. So we will see whether what we have here is consistent to the in-house vote. Professor Chair, uh, all protocols observed. Uh, let me say I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, for us, dealing with curriculum, <laughs> I think that we have to start looking at what kind of curriculum we need to now start developing, especially for pre-tertiary students, who eventually will also be caught up with AI. And for me, uh, as I sit and I listen to the debate, uh, I just think in my mind, for a point, probably my work was done, but at another point, I said, mm -mm, I still have more work to do. Because if we are going to have AI catching up with pre-tertiary, two things I need to have to develop curriculum that will probably meet the needs of the people at that stage with even our instructors. But I'm also mindful of the fact that as Africans, we cherish our interaction and our unity as human beings. So I'm caught in the fix. I will leave the, to the results. Maybe the results will give me something to go and think about. Before the debate, we had AI being a case, having 34.7 against 54.1 blessing. And the varied opinion were 11.2. Then after the debate, we had, so the closing questions came. And we have affirmative being 62.3, that is those who support, and then negative 37.7. <laughs> Am I supposed to go to the final one? Okay. So, these were the before and after. Now, putting all together, the final opinion that came up. AI as a blessing, 40.6. AI as a case, 59.4, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Edward Apia is the Director General for the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. All right, thank you very much for taking us through. So, your guess is as good as mine. And it's obvious that debate is a very, debate is a very powerful tool for shaping thoughts and perception. At this point, 
bringing the event to an end, would invite Nanaya Intodi to give us the vote of thanks. She's a member of the KNRC Debate Society and the president of the Electrical and Electronics Engineering Students Association, KNRC. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So on behalf of the KNUST Debate Society and the school at large, I would like to express our utmost gratitude. The chairperson, university registrar, special guest, provost of colleges, deans and directors, heads of departments, members of convocation, senior and junior staff, the clergy, alumni, students, the media, ladies and gentlemen. I stand before you today with a deep sense of gratitude and privilege as I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you who has graced this public debate in our prestigious school, KNUST. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Almighty God for giving us this opportunity to have this event. I would also like to express a heartfelt appreciation to our chairperson, our very own vice chancellor and mother, Professor Mrs. Rita Akosia Dixon, who presided over this event with utmost grace and proficiency. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the university registrar who played a pivotal, a pivotal role in coordinating and orchestrating this event. To our esteemed special guest, Professor Melissa Nobles, thank you for gracing us with your presence and sharing your invaluable insights about AI with us. Your wealth of knowledge has helped us to undoubted, undoubtedly enrich our intellectual curiosity. We hope to get an invite to visit your school and also know <laughs> what your students think about AI. We hope to hear from you on that. I'd also like to extend our utmost gratitude to the provost of colleges, deans, directors, the clergy, heads of departments, members of convocation, and the dedicated senior and junior staff who work tires, tirelessly behind the scenes to create a favorable environment of academic excellence for our students to experience a very lovely education system in KNUST. To our alumni, whose successes in their respective fields serve as a testament to the quality education we receive here in KNUSD, your continued support is very much appreciated. I would be remiss not to acknowledge the immense contributions of the KNUSD Debate Society for working tirelessly to make this event a reality. From our distinguished moderator to the lovely speakers you heard here today, they have worked so tirelessly to make this event a successful one. Please let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> to our students from the various high schools here present, we say thank you. To the students of KNUSD, we say thank you. Your enthusiasm, passion, and thirst for knowledge are the driving force behind the pursuit of excellence. Your active participation in these debates demonstrates your commitment to shaping the future of higher education and embracing the opportunities presented by artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. Last but not the least, I would like to express my gratitude to the media whose presence here today ensures that discussions here and insights shared during these debates reach a wider audience. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate my heartfelt thanks to each and every one here for contributing on this enriching debate. Together, we have explored the blessings and potential curses that these technologies bring. And it is through open dialogue that we get to realize that we are harnessing our future leaders and we are harnessing ourselves as students for a greater benefit of humanity. Thank you once again, and may we continue to push the boundaries of knowledge and innovation for a brighter future. Thank you, Medasi. 
Thank you to Madam President. All right, at this juncture, we started with God, and so we have to end with God for what has been a very exciting and intellectually stimulating engagement. Would invite Sir Lord Opon, who is the former financial secretary of the KNST Debate Society, to give us the closing prayer. The chairperson, all protocols duly observed. Please, can we be upstanding? All right, so we are praying. Our Lord and Master Jesus, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for gracing us. We thank you for your protection and your guidance. We thank you for the many things you've done for us. We thank you for a successful discourse. Father, Lord, we pray committing everyone over here into your hands that as we are returning to our various destination, you protect us and guide us. These are many things we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, may we take us. Hey. May we take our seat. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you very much, school band. Yeah, a photo session. Okay. So, um, we would have a photo session, the debaters together with our dignitaries. Debaters, please. Yeah, we, we, we did. You actually mentioned their names. I 